This episode is brought to you by The Running Company Geelong. We are a locally owned small business that services the running community of Geelong and surrounds. We also send product to runners all over the country, so don't be shy in reaching out. Come and see myself, Moose and our awesome team down in Geelong or on Instagram at the running company underscore Geelong. episode number 307 of the Inside Running Podcast. Thanks for joining us for another week. It's going to be a massive show this week. We've got our Sydney Marathon to obviously talk about. We've got the Diamond League Final to talk about. The Tan Relays happened. The Australian Road Racing Championships happened over at City to Bay. A good listener, predict, uh, listener question and some predictions about what might happen at the Berlin Marathon this week. Welcome to my co-host is up in Canberra, Bradley Croker. How are you this week? Good, Brady. Yourself? Yeah, good. Bit tired, Croaks, but I'm hoping you're really going to bring the energy tonight, Monday night after a uh, weekend in Sydney. So, yeah, fingers crossed you can just bring the gusto this week. See what I can do. I had a big weekend of birthday parties, so I yeah, tired that's myself. Right. You did too. Was it Viv and Lily? Uh, yeah, so Lily's birthday party Saturday, Viv's birthday yesterday, and Lily's actual birthday is tomorrow. Oh, it's all happening. My other co-host is Dan Anglesey. He was on the road to Sydney over the weekend. He finished fourth in the Australian Marathon Championships, 11th across the line in a platinum label marathon. I guess he's been uh, searching the internet all day for some saunas, may have been into some stores. Welcome to uh, Julian Spence, this week's episode. How are you, Moose? Uh, tired and sore. Last Just being... Just regressing all day. Last time I saw you, you were throwing down beers at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So uh, a big day on the beers also. Yeah, but I was was in one of those states where you can drink and drink and drink and not even feel the tiniest bit drunk. I think it just all, I don't know, goes goes into some area of your body that you're depleted out there on the course because, yeah, I was drinking a fair bit and not getting drunk and... Made me my body actually started feeling better throughout the day. I was walking around like I hadn't even done anything. Jeez, woke up that. Well, yeah, but I woke up at like four thirty and took a piss, and I could barely make it to the bathroom. It, could, <laughs> <laughs> it was um, it, it hit me pretty quick. And as I lie here right now, I've just got that post marathon soreness where someone's beaten you with a mallet. Yeah, that's it. You flew home today as well, so you've been in the air and now back home? Yeah, yeah, got home got home about five, uh, so it was a long day of travel because we had to go pick up Pia from um, Bree's parents' house, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's good to be home. Bloody love it getting home, just so nice. I feel like every time I leave, I'm like, good reminder you're living in the best place in the world. Mm. All right, well, do you want to take us through your week and then we'll get into the meaty stuff about Sydney Marathon and your performance there? Yeah, it was a pretty, um, well, what do you call it, aggressive taper when you when you taper more quickly and harshly or would you say it's a generous taper? I like, What's the word, the right I word like there? aggressive taper when you do it like that. Yeah, so Cut I'm going to say quick. fairly aggressive taper because I, I, I um, only run once every day and they were pretty short, so... 42 minutes on the Monday, uh, four, less than 42 on the, the Tuesday. Wednesday, I did a little workout in the, the sands. I did four by five minutes at marathon effort, and I think I took two minutes fully between. So that was an easy workout. And my goal was to just find rhythm, so find marathon rhythm. It was a pretty nice day, really. So I, I, it just felt quite easy. Uh, it's hard. I felt like I had the brakes on the whole time, um, which is good. Is exactly what I wanted it to feel like. So the laps that I ran there was 321, 319, 320, and the last one was 323. 
I think that may have been into a pretty strong headwind, perhaps. I'm not sure, but whatever. It felt fine. Um, then on the next day, I ran 37 minutes. Uh, the runs were getting progressively quicker because I was feeling fresher. So I've run 4.11 pace. And then I um, ran with Bree for 5K in the Botanic Gardens in Sydney on Saturday morning. So I got out fairly early. Bree did her long run. I just did a bit of it with her. Did a few strides on an oval there. Pretty nice place to run down around that opera house along the, the trail around MacArthur. I think it's Mrs. MacArthur's seat, they call it, which... Mrs. Macquarie's, isn't it, Croaks? Oh, Macquarie, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah feature later on um, <laughs> uh, in the race and in the, the recap. But I didn't see the hill, really, because I've run just around the, the water. So I never really went up any hill. And I thought, oh, that's okay. I'll save that for the day. Like a little bit of anticipation of what I'm in for because everyone sort of warned me of it. Um, then I went out to the expo, which was a bit of an ordeal. So I tried to get out there as early as possible. It was out in a suburb called Alexandria, uh, which if I open my map up, like we, we pretty much had to catch a train but we got lucky it was mainly it was going to be two trains and then you got off the second train and you had to get on a um, shuttle bus that took you to the expo then you would go in and once I was at the expo it was in out pretty easy uh, but it, just the shuttle bus situation was wasn't ideal um, the day before the race like it was about a two and a half hour turnaround um, from leaving the house to getting back which I know Berlin's the same because it's so many people, they have to put it somewhere like big enough to handle it. It's one of those issues because the start finish line, finish line are different. So you, you can't really put it at the start line. The finish line, there's no venues big enough to put it. So there has to be somewhere to, to like some big warehouse or exhibition center to, to host the, the expo. I just, it just creates a little bit more stress than you, you need probably probably. Uh, may, I don't know whether there was the option of getting them posted. I don't think there was. Uh, you didn't have to do it though, Brady. You wouldn't know about it. Mm, yeah. Didn't have to Lucky pick up a bib. Lucky fella. Um, and yeah, so that Arvo met you, saw you at the drink drop-off um, up at the Sofitel, the race hotel. So they just put drinks out for uh, myself, for Watto and for Matt Gunther, neither of those boys couldn't make it. So yeah, spent fuck. It took me a while to make drinks for three people, like mixing the drinks, writing names, numbers, kilometer station on each bottle. It actually takes a long time. Uh, I like I, I I was decorating mine so that I could see them because if you haven't noticed, everyone uses pop tops now. So you go to the supermarket the day before a marathon, the pop tops are sold out. And there's only one, st well, I've only really found one style of pop top lately and it's the more rounded one, whereas they all used to be little square ones or rectangles. And, and so you run up to a, a drinks table and there's six or seven bottles looking very similar. You, you have to pay close attention. So I, I, I had these, we went to like a um, lolly, lolly store and I found these really long, like straws full of um, sherbet candy that are different colors. And so I taped that to my bottle and they're about sort of 30 centimeters long. And so, so they were really good. Like I sort them from miles away. Hey, Brady has this bloke. He's got two personal pacemakers and then he's whinging about having to look after them with, the, with their drinks. Should have heard the stuff he was whinging about all weekend, Croaks. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, what did you put in the, in the drink bottles? Morton? Uh, no, I didn't use Morton. I had a mix of things. I had um, oh, a mix. So like I had some pure drink mix. I had pure gels taped to my bottles. I had some Morton gels on the bottle. I had some Coda electrolyte tablets as well. So I, I, I changed it up. And then I had Coke, flat Coke at the um, on the last two drink stops. And outside of the first drink station, I got every single bottle. 
so that that worked really well for me and I, I i pretty much got down the majority of every drink and every gel that i picked up so pretty successful on the the nutrition side were your me. bottles on the um the road side of the table or you know how oh, they nah, up? they were yeah. on the other side it was a bit and, of a, a bit mate, of a stitch up wasn't that why i've got small arms too like getting my arms over there that was hard work <laughs> If you say so Croak's picture a trestle table, like sitting on the side of the road. Elevated now, on a gutter. Elevated, yeah, elevated on a gutter. And so as you run towards it, there's there was a you you had a allocation of where your bottle was gonna be. So it was good like that. Yeah. Every single time you came to an aid station, the, the the tables were numbered one to ten, I think they were. We were I was on number seven and I knew even on number seven, the bib numbers were allocated a specific point on the table where the, the drink would be. So every time you're like, okay, I'm three up on the right-hand side, except the right-hand side was on the other edge of the table. Mm -hmm. So you're running towards the table at three, well, later on, 320 pace, and you're trying to get the bottle over everyone else's bottles because by that stage, most of these Africans had Oh, it wasn't really an African table, but there wasn't like a, a lot of people that had been before us. And so I'm reaching across over other people's drinks and trying to get it from the other side of the table. It, it, it was really difficult. I had the um, same issue with at Gold Coast because I was pacing. They put mine yeah on that outside edge. And because you're pacing, you're in front. And so you like you're trying to get it quickly without like having people run up the back of you and slow them down. Um, yeah. Whereas in previous years, like, yeah, we were put on the, the closest side of the table. So it was much easier just to grab and, and keep running at speed. So much easier. I've never had to deal with that before. I never really considered it an issue. Um, and the, the, at the technical meeting, someone asked, um, are the drink tables always going to be on the left hand or the, I think it was the left-hand side of the road. And the answer was generally yes. Uh, and so at 5K, <laughs> I'm like on the left-hand side of the road. And before I know it, I've passed every single p station because there's a pack next to us. I'm like, oh, shit, that was on the right-hand side of the road. And so I would fully, we all fully missed it. I think it was just around a corner too maybe. Um, so I didn't really care. It was the 5K mark. It was a good one to miss, but then it was a real wake-up call to actually pay attention. Hang on. Weren't as, they all on the right-hand side of the – the whole course was the right-hand side, wasn't it? Uh, well, it was the first one on the left-hand side then. Maybe. I don't know. But, yeah, I, every, I was only there for the first 30K, but I think um, – I think most oh, of them yeah, the maybe right hand side, vice, vice versa then. Yeah. I think the, the first one might you have been on the left-hand left. side then. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and so it was really confusing. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I was expecting them all on the right-hand side, actually. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but um, it was fine. Once the pack spread out, we, we made a point of always getting to the front of the pack um, when the, the aid stations came up. But, yeah, that so I um, went to that and that meeting that – that you were at. But tell the listeners what else the stuff they go through. A lot of people would have never sat in one of those meetings. Well, they they, they basically go through the elite athlete booklet where mm. it, it, it's a schedule thing. So what happens at different times on the race morning, pretty much everything from, from when the athlete wakes up, like what time the buses leave, where to meet, breakfast protocol, when you get there, what, who, where the tents are, what's going to be in the tents, what the start line procedure looks like, who's going to shuttle you, at what time you have to be ready, the bag drop for elites, kind of the same thing that would be all be on a website for the general punters, but it's just different instructions for the elites. And then there is the pacing, which is probably the most significant thing, is uh, they, they announce who the, the paces are and, and the, the times that, or the, the pace that you'll be running. So that, that was announced and you were, you did made you a, re did you get a round of applause? Mate, Brady. No, I should have seen these shit croaks. <laughs> you should have, you should have seen him. So they Carlos did the male Birmingham. paces and they said, oh, the two males paces here. And like a couple of blokes just like put their hands up and like, yep. And the female paces, Brady, you hear Brady walks from where he was to the <laughs> middle of the room 
two hands waving. He's like, yep, all over here. All eyes on me, boys. <laughs> this is bullshit, Brady. Crocs. I was standing, be, I was standing not, behind a pole yeah. and Wayne couldn't see me. He's like, Brady, I swear you're here. Brady, where are you? And I was like, I'm trying to walk so he can actually see me from the back of the room. As I'm doing this, he's like, Brady, stand up. And, and then he finally sees me and I wave to him. And then Collis Birmingham makes a joke. There's like 150 people in this room. He goes, Brady, he said stand up when I was clearly standing up, taking the piss out of me how short I am. And the whole room will cax themselves laughing. And I'm like, that was a shit joke. The whole room has tiny Africans in there that are shorter than me anyway. And then It wasn't so, a shit joke. It was only a shit joke if, if it was uh, because it was you. Yeah, it really lightened the room though, didn't it, Moose? Yeah, because then um, well, I don't think Wayne heard the joke. No, he did, It was yeah. like... You sure you're going to be all right with this so pacing? Then, yeah, so Crooks, then he <laughs> thought I, they were laughing because they were concerned that I wouldn't be able to do the pacing job. Hmm. So he's then taken, like, more jokes about, you, yeah, you can drop out early if you want. If you can't do it, we can find somewhere else. And I'm like, oh, shit, fucking hell, let's just move on. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was that? yeah, and so what else was there? Because I left a smidge early because, I like, the lifts, <laughs> the lifts took a long time and there was 150 people trying to get down and it was – a long wait, so I got out early and got on the first lift. So I'm not sure what else they covered at the end. No, nah, that was pretty much it. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Trying to. Yeah. Oh, they handed out the bibs afterwards when you were talking about oh, that did before. They? Yeah. Oh. So bibs. Um, we had to do like a shoe decla- declaration earlier. So you had to take your shoes and your race kit down. You did. Yeah. Even I said, I don't need to do this. I'm just pacing. They're like, no, no, you need to do it just in case someone breaks a record. They need to know like everyone was in legal shoes for the pacing and stuff as well. Which uh. I thought was interesting. Yeah, um, that is interesting. Yeah. Especially if you don't finish, like, oh, anyway. Um, yeah, so that was the evening. Went out, got pasta, pasta meal, and then um, watched a bit of footy. Port Adelaide, GWS were on. And I got to bed, got a fairly good sleep. It was a pretty, it was like kind of nervous. Uh, still wondering... I was in this anxious mode of not knowing what the exact race plan was mm. for myself just because I didn't know how hot it would be. And not that I, I didn't know how hot it would be, but how hot I would feel. And then I was also, I hate basing my plans around other people. And, and I'd, I'd, I'd almost committed to going with the women's pack because it made a lot of sense that there would be a, a huge group of people running together, as, uh, including some of those that I was competing against. Um, so I, I, I kind of committed to that, but then I was just worried about what they would do. And the, plan, the pacing was supposed to be for 2.22 finish time, which is 3.21s like per K, Brady, was it? 3.22s. 3.22s. Through okay, half and yeah. 71 dead. Yeah, and, and I thought, oh, that's fucking, like, that's a bit sharp if it's going to be warm. And I know the 15 to 20K mark, there's a, there's a decent array of hills and it's pretty much all climbing. And I thought, oh, this could be dangerous. And so I was anxious about that. Uh, but I ended up sleeping pretty well, got up fairly early. I, I, had, I was sort of in two minds about trying to sneak on the buses at your hotel to get to the, the start line or just walk to the, the train station and I, I did. I really just did in between. <laughs> I walked to the hotel, saw the buses looked pretty full, kept walking, and then got to the train station. There was a ton of people. Um, the, we, I was. I got on the last train stop before the race, and so the train that rocked up. They were running every two minutes, so it was very well done. But every train was like a sardine can. It was just full. And then when I got to our station, it just got even fuller. But it was only six or seven minutes. Pulled out of the train when we got there, wandered around the, the mass start area, trying to work out where I was. I didn't pay enough attention to that briefing the night before to know where I was supposed to go. Uh, asked a few people they didn't know, and then got lucky and followed someone up past the start line into the uh, elite tent area, which was really relaxing because you were there, Benny Saint, Collis, and just sat down. Collis got me a coffee. Um, and... I was there pretty early, so I had an hour or so of, of chilling out. Had a banana. Um, what else did I do? Foam roll, went for a little jog. Just we had an area where, like a grassed area where you could jog around, maybe the oh, size of a tennis court. Jogged around a little bit. 
and then yeah, talk to talk to Matt and Ash who who came to the start line. That they were going to run with me. That was the plan for the the first however long they could. Um, and you you were sort of a little bundle of nervous energy, weren't you? I thought I was pretty relaxed actually. Did you? Yeah. That was a yeah. weird headspace for me because I'm like, mm, kind of, you're there, but you're not there to race, you know what I mean? You introduced yourself to all the women? Uh, I, yeah, I found the Kenyan pacer who I was pacing with, and then um, I met... You speak Bet- English? Hey, uh, not yes. real well, not, and like my English is probably not the easiest to understand, um, but then I saw Betsy, the I think she's American now, she ended up winning the race, and then she had really good English, had a bit of a oh, chat yeah. to her. Um so that was good. So, so was the pacemaker her pacemaker, like her connection? No, I don't think so. Yeah, I'm yeah, not sure. Yeah. I think he was. He did seem to be talking to a few different ladies at different times, but um, yeah, not so much her because I think she's ASICs in America, mm-hmm. and she seemed to be with the ASICs. Like, I'm not sure who that guy was, the manager. Oh yeah. Every time yeah. I saw her in the race hotel, she was with him, whereas he seemed to be very much with like a whole group of. Um, Kenyans every time I saw him so yeah we pretty much took it to the finish line he only he only sort of stepped aside with a few hundred meters to go yeah he came 12th or something didn't he overall in the end yeah yeah he, um, <laughs> he did pretty well um yeah he was yeah she was really good and really friendly and she was saying that she was trying to get started at Chicago because I said to her I'm like oh you were a late entry for this like your name wasn't on the original like promo because she's ran 221 at, at um Tokyo this year and then she was saying that, yeah, this came up like kind of last minute and, yeah, she jumped on the opportunity for it. Yeah, maybe some cash opened up with Tola leaving. Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure if that's, yeah, that's when it happened. Yeah, Potentially. well, you lose one big, big dog, you get 30 smaller dogs. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so the the race... I, I put it actually. I I put an ice vest on. I brought an ice vest up. I have one at home, so I took that with me, and I had it stored in the hotel that I was staying at in the freezer, and I picked it up that morning and and I did a little small warm up, one k only, just basically to get rid of some nervous energy and like jumble the tummy so I could go to the toilet, <laughs> and so that that did the trick. And then I put the ice vest on for about I'm gonna say about twenty minutes before the race. Uh, took it off right before the start <clears throat> and then chatted with the crew in, at the start line. They held us there for a fair while, maybe like 10, 15 minutes. Slowly watched the sun come up uh, above the buildings and the, the the temperatures just rising slightly. So when I first woke up, I think it was about 19 degrees and then it, it dropped from 4 o'clock down to maybe like 6, 6.30, it was at its coolest, and then it started to climb again. Uh, and, yeah, the race starts on a bit of a hill. I was just pretty much locked into running with the women by then, and I, it, I knew they were going 3.22 pace, and I thought that was borderline too fast for this course and the conditions for me. So I jumped on the back of the group and was pretty surprised, like, initially at how slow that felt we went up straight onto the Harbour Bridge. That was the, the first K and over the bridge. So it was pretty epic. It, it's a fantastic way to start a race. And it really clears the, the roads open and you get a lot of space and you can sort of see what's going on. It, it, the nerves disappear immediately and you can you can see who's around. I had a chat to a few people just trying to sort of work out what was going on. You were up the front. I think you, tr- you did run 322 for the first K, Brady. Is that right? Mm, I'm just opening my file now. I've got yours open. So yeah, well, there wouldn't have been many of them. There weren't many. Three twenty two. No, so you not, got like which, which is interesting, Moose, that you're saying because I one of my questions, and I, I didn't want to get into it too much before you did your whole um, race. But the oh, fact, no, do it, do it, do well, it as we go. I reckon. It's yeah, I can also do my pace and stuff as we go while we're yeah. talking well, about it. Yeah, like looking back at it now, I, I personally think it was almost the perfect scenario for you in that mm. i think as you said like 322s like my question is like if the girls did go 322s would have you gone with them and what would have been the end result which we obviously we're not going to know but what worked for you was well you weren't there to run a quick time you weren't there to run a pb 
Um, the girls were going more like 330s and you could sit in that pack. You're also then within the Aussie only prize money, which like why do you need to run any faster when you're yeah. in that prize money and you just sit there for as long as you want and then close a little bit harder. So I, I think it was almost like perfect the way that it played out for you. Whereas if the girls did go 322s and you went with them, I'm not sure if it would have been the yeah. same result. Well, Dean Menzies did go 322s, and and he he took a couple of people with him, and I watched them go and thought, yeah, that's not a right spot for me up there. That's a bit quick. I felt like that would have been outside my capabilities. So I, you're right. It was perfect. And by kilometre two, I was looking around the pack thinking, this is a this is a race here. This is the Australian Championships. Like I, everyone in that pack was thinking the same thing. Every, every male, Australian male in that pack was thinking the same thing. Uh, Tommy and I, we were chatting early about the, the people ahead of us and the gaps that we had. And we because were talking there were about... Australian guys ahead. It wasn't just Brett and Dean. There was like no. four or five other Australian... He wasn't in the money at this stage, Crokes. Yeah, okay. But obviously had a lot of confidence that we'll be seeing those guys later on, in which we yep. did. Yeah, and there were a few times that um, the pack got going... And there, were, like, there was a pack that left off the front that, that we kind of considered going with uh, but backed off and stayed, stayed behind. And I know Tommy, Tommy actually went to go one time. And I said to him as he went to go, I said, oh, Tommy, you reckon, mate? It's a long way by yourself up there, like as in that those guys aren't going to last. And he just he like looked back and goes, oh, he said something like, oh, you bastard. And he stopped and stayed with us. Um, I reckon he was pretty pretty happy he made that decision too, uh, but yeah, we we were all pretty much working together in, in that pack. Like, and this was all before two k, I reckon, um, and and the pack just established itself at two k. And Brady was on the front. He looked very confused. Croaks. He was like oh, running off the front, <laughs> looking around. He's looking at the other Kenyan bloke. He's looking at us. He's like, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> Because they, they wanted no bar of him. They were totally disregarding his presence. They were looking at each other, and, and he was just some weird guy out the front yeah. running like a yo-yo off the front. Well, I was chatting to Zacher in our group chat, and I look, I saw early on that you guys weren't rolling 322s as like what Brady was meant to be running. And so Zacher said something like, oh, what do you reckon the chat is? And I reckon, I said, oh, I reckon Brady's asking Moose, hey, Moose, do you reckon they'll still pay me if, like, I'm not running 322s, yeah. even though the girls are running, like, 330s? And then I said, and then you would be saying, uh, I don't fucking know. All I know is I'm doing your job because I'm yeah. doing the work here, so I'm taking a cut of whatever you're getting today. No, we, I clarified that the night before. So my discussions <laughs> with the, the manager was, if they don't come with a pace, what do you want me to do? And he kind of just said, pretty much like use your own judgment, run in front of them, try to encourage them to like almost half step them, go a bit quicker to encourage them to get on the back and then try to run the pace so they'll follow you. But if they don't follow you, keep the group together for as long as possible so it's a decent race. So I kind of, I wasn't concerned about the money side of things and the payment because I knew that was option number two. But shit, it was hard because you're like, instead of just locking in the 322s and holding it and just worry about that, I'm looking over my shoulder every like 30 seconds to make sure now I'm running the pace, but they're setting the pace. I've just got to stay in front of the pace, which is the complete opposite to pace making. And it's not a course for consistent oh. pace either. Uh, no. And no I'd way. be like, I'd be like getting a bit too far ahead at times. And then I look behind, I'm like, I've got to slow this down. And then like, then someone would surge up to my heels and then I'm like, oh, I've got to get back in front of you. And then it's just, it was terrible croaks. So it was doing my head in. Well, if you have a look at my kilometer splits, look at the elevations for the first, let's say 8K, right? It's gone 13 up, 21 up, 23 down, 33 down, 10 up, 11 down, 10 up, 12 down. Like that's a cross country course. Mm. That You can't run an even pace on that. You can try to run an even effort, but it's not gonna be the same pace. Mm. And it, it, it was noticeable that those girls wanted no bar of the uphills at all. And, and they would, some of them would start to stretch out on the downhill. And then as soon as they realized that they had got to the front and that they were the ones that had, were dictating the pace, they put, they jammed the brakes on. And we run straight up the back of them if we were behind because they all would stop and no mm. one wanted yeah. to be near the front. And it was pretty funny. Like we, had, we, we were laughing a little bit about it because it it's just fun. 
Like it was a fun time. It was a yeah. fun section of running. Um, Did you notice the heat moves, or because the pace was so easy? Um, like was, no doubt, like you ex- you would have expected to run faster than what you did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the day. Um, and because you're running a lot slower than that, did you still notice the heat or not no, really? I didn't notice the heat until 25, 26K. I, I didn't feel hot at all. And and it was the, I didn't feel any hills either. So the, the hills were there, but the pace was so slow that they weren't having a real effect on my heart rate and, and effort level. So I was comfortable um, the, the whole way. And I think the heart rate stayed low I was hitting every drink station. I was every in, intermediate drink station. So they added every a water station every two and a half k but between the, the main aid stations, mm-hmm. and and the heat wasn't a problem for me until later, uh, and it, and it hit pretty hard when it hit. But I, I like I saw I was speaking to Watto about twelve k. I'm like, Watto, you look hot, and he's just bucketing sweat. He's face is red he's like yeah it's so fucking hot today but <laughs> i was like it's not, really it's, it actually feels fine to me and i don't know how did you feel about the heat brady when did you f- start feeling hot no i never really felt hot at any stage like um more my irritations were with what cooked me i thought was the change of pace so regularly and just the lack of rhythm that you could get on the course um i felt they were more of the factors that created fatigue yeah yeah so in saying that i got out i'm I'm talking about someone who got out at 32k and a a lot of that centennial park was a bit shaded as well i thought so that's when i got out i think you would be more exposed on those open roads from 32k onwards yeah it it was way more exposed later yeah there there was shaded too croak yeah the the, the harbour bridge obviously you come off that it's sun's not strong enough at that time to worry but then you get down and as like I don't know that I know the Piedmont, the, you're very shaded in there, and you can you can see on the elevation profile there's some pretty sharp little pinches, but the paces we were running it didn't really matter, um, and and the buildings were pretty tall, so you could you were very well hidden. There was a lot of shade, uh, and and then you ran down Bang, along the Bangaroo that was very um shady through there. Bangaroo, is that that Miller's? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. So that bang- was where it was like there was like trees in the middle of the path, and like it was like boardwalky yeah. kind of stuff. That was the that was the shit bit. Like, that's a shit bit to run on though, because we were in a pretty big pack. Yeah, and pretty... and, and it was like a walking path, really. Yeah. Like it's not for cars, um, and so there was like trees through the middle. You're right. A few bollards, and then there was some twisty corners through Circular Key. That was good atmosphere through there though. Yeah, well, no, you came around that th- circular key. You got back on the road. Yeah, and and that was really cool. So that's where the start of the hill was. So by that stage, like I'd committed to staying with the pack until twenty k, because I wanted to use the pack and the strength of the pack to up the hill. And so from fifteen to twenty, like it's just basically uphill. It's actually only fifteen to like nineteen, really, that was uphill, and then. From there, I decided like that's the point where we can make a decision. Uh, but going up that hill, I could see that there was already runners coming back to us, and the the ra- it had turned into a race for the between us for the like the the lower placings of Cash. the Australia <laughs> race for dollars. Soon as. Um, and so. Tommy and I were like, yeah, we work together well. Matt, um, what I pulled out about 15, well, he didn't pull out at all. He just backed off the pace and then he ran 237 to finish. So he, he did pretty well to hang on there. Um, Matt, Matt was good. Matt was sort of controlling us if or controlling me if I felt like I was too far, if he felt I was pressing too much when I didn't have to. Because there were a few times that I started leading the pack and I'm th- like, what are you doing? Like Brady's getting money to do this, and these women are getting paid to be here. Like you should, you've got more rights sitting in behind them. Than H- hence, being hence my comment about you saying Brady, I'm taking a cut of what you're exactly. doing today because yeah. I'm doing the job. It was annoying the shit out of me, Crooks, as well, because like I'd feel like if heels on my um or people on my heels, and I look behind, and it's like Matt Gunther, Tom Decano, and Moose, and then I look further back, and the chicks are like a bit further back. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm going to get out of your way. I'm not here to pace you guys. Move. move. Well, you weren't pacing anyone, to be honest. <laughs> well, it stayed in front of the pace. 
the, well, the, the pack, because we were at the front of the pack the majority of the time, I'm not sure what was happening in it. We saw a few times that the, the U-turns, there were, there were a couple of U-turns that were fairly tight and that, that wasn't much fun. Um, but you did, it did give you a chance to see what was happening in front of you and behind you. Uh, so we got up to Hyde Park. Uh, what no, was Hyde Park? More, more Park. Like that's where your halfway split kind of was, I think. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Centennial Park, I think it's yep, called. Yep. Yeah, so up to the grass area up there. And um, that's when we hit 20K. I started to see that some of the, the, the other domestics in front of us had, had started to blow up a little bit. And then I, I thought, shit, Menzies is a fair way in front here. Uh, Dean Menzies, he was by himself at that point. I thought, all right, if we want to have a crack at pulling him back, then we probably need to, to start moving now. And so Matt and Tommy and I, we pushed on from the pack at 20. We went through halfway in 114. 10 or something like that 114 14 maybe and I, I i looked over at tommy i'm like this bloke's never run this slow in a marathon his whole life like i've done this a lot <laughs> 114 this was <laughs> this is a regular sight for me back in the day so i i, I kind of I, I didn't really feel like it was slow or anything i just i just was thinking tommy as as an elite he would be thinking this is ridiculous so we, we pushed on. We put a fairly decent gap. I think the splits, well, my splits anyway, from 20 to 21, it went like 226. I mean, 326, 22, 17, 16, 21, 25, 19, 17, 22, 23, 21. So we, we were running about 220 pace through there. We were catching. We caught those guys really quickly. Uh, Matt dropped out about 25. Tom missed his bottle, at the, or it wasn't there at the aid station. And so Matt stopped to try to get it for him, which was generous. Didn't help me much. Uh, I stopped to wait for Tommy to catch up because I thought at that point it was better that we ran together rather than solo because it was still so far from the finish. But then Tommy just got moving, and he just he dropped like a 308 in there and then a 313. And that, that's where I think he put the gap on me, about 28, 29K. And I, I had a decision to make. Like Physically, I probably could have covered that at that particular time, but I felt like it was so early, it would have been a real risk to, to go with that, um, that pace and that effort. And, and I wasn't ready to take that risk. So I knew it was only getting hotter and... I would be more exposed and I was already starting to feel kind of fatigued and the, all those U-turns through the park, there were a ton of them. Um, every time I turned around, I, I started to feel like or oh, different areas of my legs. When you decelerate and then you accelerate out of the U-turn, you start to notice the different muscles that are, that are getting tight or fatigued or sore and oh, I thought, oh shit, I reckon I'm feeling that a bit too much. So I decided to stick back, and I it was the it saved my race. I reckon if I had have ran those two k with Tommy, I would have been on the sidelines after that because I couldn't have kept up. I couldn't have handled it. So he he ran off on me pretty quick. No one was really coming from behind. I was wor I was wondering when the women would come. Uh, out out of the park, I knew it was downhill, and so that it was actually pretty nice running from about oh, like I'm gonna say maybe like 30k I reckon we went downhill and the back side of the park it felt pretty downhill and then you go uphill and then you do a weird little turn um then you go uphill and that up uphill and then you hook a right for an out and back and it's a really sharp little nasty hill and this was fully exposed so that the section from probably 32 and a half to 35 and a half was was difficult for me, that was my hardest point. And I went through a really bad patch there and thought, oh, this is gonna go either way here. Like I, I, have, to, I have to make some calls as to the pace I, I put out because I could be like that jogging in the way I was feeling. But I turned and I, I got a drink and I started to go downhill a bit and all of a sudden, like the pace started to get better. My legs came better 
like uh, I, I got some, I got a uh, couple of bags of ice. Someone was handing ice out on the side in plastic bags, and it was it was just a dream. And then um, Rachel McGuinness actually, she she handed me a a froze like a, a ice cold bottle of water, and and that turned everything around for me. It was like getting stabbed in the heart with an adrenaline pen, you know, on um, <laughs> Pulp Fiction when they do. <laughs> That's what it felt like for me, like this bottle of water over the head. And I came to life, and I reckon I dropped maybe a, a 320 after that. And the the few Ks before that was slow. I went like 328, 338, 327, down to 322, 320, 319. And then this, um, you run down a hill at about 39 K, uh, and then you've got to turn around. It's called Mrs. McQuarrie's chair, and it's a like the point on the next. Uh, bay around from the opera house and you do like a, a hook turn at the bottom or a, a u-turn i guess it's just around like a roundabout or something and then you come straight back up and this was brutal this was fully exposed to the sun uh there hadn't been an aid station for a while here i, I was getting no water or anything and you're going uphill the only thing going for me up this hill was that there were a couple of africans that i was picking off and so I could s- sort of pick them out and, and run and chase them. Uh, so that was that was quite good. But I knew at the very top that the, the, the downhill run to the finish was brilliant. So to me, the end of the race was at the top of this hill. And, and this was right where we were staying as well. So I, I, I sort of knew the area decently well. So I got to the top and then I got a bit of a kick on, like I got a bit of a surge because I knew that the race was over soon. So I... I closed relatively well. Last 500 meters was 3:12 pace. Very downhill, and you come into like the best part of this race is the finish line. You come down, you run along this road behind the Opera House. It's called Macquarie Street, and then you spat out onto the pier area at the Opera House, and you like all the crowds sit on the stairs up to the Opera House entrance, and you're running in like an amphitheater. The finish. And on the right-hand side is like a park, a very steep sort of hill with a park on it. And on the left is crowds, and I think they had um, seating. And then at the back behind it was the opera house. And that was incredible. Like, that that was a brilliant fit. It's one of the best finishes to a race I've ever um, experienced. And, and I, I think the downhill, the 500 metres of downhill, actually more like the, the 1,500 metres to finish downhill gets people in a, a better state of mind. So everyone's starting to run faster, their heart rates drop, they know the finish is coming. It, it, you, your mood improves dramatically. And so you can appreciate the finish line a lot more when you're in a real positive state of mind. And that's what happened to me. Uh, so I, I, I negative split the race. I lapped my watch at halfway. I got 114.13. And then on the second half, I got 111.58 which the, de- the second half is downhill and like it's an easier probably run uh, in terms of like the, the, the roads were more open. There were a lot more U-turns in the second half, but the, the, the main thing was the temperature increase from probably like 19 to, to 26 or something by the, by the finish. And this, the full sun exposure was, was pretty hard, hard work out there. I wish I took a hat. Um, yeah, but it's always, I, I finished, I thought, yeah, that was pretty good. Like the time was 3.26.07 or 08 or something, 2.26.08 maybe. Yeah. And I thought, well, slower than I wanted, but everyone had a shit day today. Like I don't think anyone <laughs> ran as fast as they wanted to or th- that they thought they might if the weather was good. And I was... I picked up some places towards the end. I finished fourth Australian, which I knew at that time I was fourth Australian. Uh, 11th overall, I didn't know about. I was pretty happy with the finish result. And the, the way that I finished the race, I was really happy that I negative split and that I pushed through some bad patches in the second half and I was able to overcome that. So I, I give myself at the end a B for the race and a B is pretty rare to get it like i was thinking before if like a b in a 5k is isn't that good because it's 
you can run a 5K every weekend and, and you have a lot more better 5K races than you do marathons. And so to hit a B in a marathon almost feels like an A because you're celebrating more than just the B result. You're celebrating the fact that you had a positive experience in a marathon. Um, and that's that's where I'm at now. I think it was good, Moose. Like I um, messaged you the night before and I said basically like you don't have to do anything like spectacular tomorrow. It's more about just getting a good one on the board again because mm-hmm. you haven't done a marathon since 2019 and then come away from this with some confidence to springboard into like next year and, you know, get back to that sort of like well under 220 again. Um, and like, as I said earlier on, I, I think it was, it was probably a good thing that the women didn't go with the pace because, you know, although you negative splitted by a couple of minutes, it would have been interesting. Like, had you gone 72 through halfway, because it sounded like it got re- re- relatively tough towards the end. If you went 72 through half, then it might have been more of like a you know, 76, 77 second half. So yeah. I think it, it played out like perfectly for you. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I think it did too. Uh, and I got to have fun. Like it was really fun running with your mates in a big mar- marathon like that. I, I really enjoyed it and it got hard but i was looking forward to to it getting hard as well like what's the point of doing it if it's fun and easy the whole way that's not what marathoning is about uh like i got to enjoy a bit of it and then i got to find like the locker for a little bit and i i, I think through the taper you start to miss feeling like you're challenged in any way that's that's probably the psychological um Oh, I guess like piece of the puzzle you miss. And that's why I, I get moody, I reckon, through the last two to three weeks of training is that you're never really challenging yourself mentally or physically and everything's done to preserve yourself and you're not allowing yourself to, to get out there and pu- push yourself. And that's a really hard thing to do. So when you get to the marathon, you feel like, oh, all right, it's time to go. Like, And people, that's where people go wrong is they've got all this built up sort of psychological like a, a bubble that they want to just pop and um and it's nice to have people around controlling you to to, to pop it later on in the day uh and i reckon a lot of people popped it too early yesterday yeah but you were good it was a good message that one like it didn't have to be spectacular and it wasn't and that was the best result that you could have got yeah. so yeah you achieved what you wanted to achieve come home with some cash next yeah speaking of the cash next question moose what are you most happy with from yesterday? One, finishing your first marathon since 2019. Two, picking up $5,000. Or three, bucks. getting a win over the Aussie hero, Ned Brockman. <laughs> oh, what did he end up running? 305, I think. So you're, oh, okay. you're one you're one nil against Ned, Moose. 1-0. Oh. Yeah, right. Hero. Look, there was, a, there was a lot of carry on about Brockman he was there floating around doing a bit of shadow boxing in the um shadow boxing in the VIP tent next to the elite tent uh a lot of selfies over there um I'm gonna stay I'm gonna stick out with a no comment here Croaks to the last answer I'm happy about I, I've beaten Brady in another marathon that's, baby. That's I did feel well, like... DNF. Do you get is I always count DNFs as being beaten. I did. I didn't have a name on my bib. I was pace <laughs> forty five. That's who I was. Well, right. interesting. So Brady, then when you pulled out, how were you feeling? Like if you had to run another ten k. Oh, so yeah. So we. I was feeling real good and like talking to Moose at a few stages. Like he's like, this is slow. I'm like, yes, I know this is slow. Like, um, and then so at. So I had options in my contract to go to 25, 32, or 40K. And I was kind of like, when it was slow, I was like, okay, I'll go to 40K. I'll pick up the cash to get me to 40K, and then I may as well finish. But then when we got to, it was about 30 and a half K, we were going up a slight hill in Centennial Park, and two of the ladies um, got right on our heels. And then the Kenyan guy looked over to me and just said, like, faster, faster. And then I think we ran a 307 for K, or maybe it was a 315 for K31, which half of that was pretty slow, and then we picked it up. And then I was pretty much like full gas. We ran, I ran a 307 from then 31 to 32K, and I'm just like, I've got to pull out now because there's no way I can keep this up to 40K. 
and I don't want to even try. And this is a convenient point to in my contract to, to step off. So I um my decision was made easily for me because I don't think I could have I do I did watch the video back today and after they did make that big move and blow the whole group to pieces, they did settle it back down a bit. But um yeah, once that move was made there, it pretty much made up my mind that I would uh I would then pull out. And then I think it took me an hour and fifty minutes to get back to the finish line. So I had to get I walked out of Centennial Park. And I got a few people like, oh, you'll be right, mate. Come on, just start back jogging. You, you can get there. It's nearly there. And I had to explain, like, no, no, but I had a role to do. And this is a thank you anyway for the encouragement. So a bit of a walk of shame for a while. And then I found an official um, that had a car. And then they kind of said, yeah, wait here. We've got cars organised for the pacemakers. And then a couple of minutes later, they got on the radio and told me to walk about oh, 500 metres up to this next zone. And there was a guy there waiting with a car. But then it was a logistical nightmare because you had not only the paces all pulling out at different sections because it's they tell you the technical meeting the night before there's going to be a car to, to get you back to the finish line where like my bag and phone and um, you know swipe card for the hotel and all that is. But you never want to lock in which point you're going to pull out of. And then you've also got all the, well, not all the, there was a lot though in the men's and women's elite fields that also pulled out. So I've got a lot of these like Africans, Ethiopians um, walking around Centennial Park who don't have great English trying to figure out how they're getting back to the start line. So the guy who picked me up, his radio was just buzzing with like, we need someone at checkpoint 37. We've got two Kenyans here who need to be picked up. And then we've got someone at the point 35. Da, da, da. So um, yeah, I kind of went on a bit of a tour around Sydney trying to find um, some of these guys to get back in the car so we could take them to the finish line. In the end, we found none of them. I'm not sure if they're still in Centennial Park where they are if they've been accounted for. But, um, yeah, then I ended up getting dropped back at the finish line. And at this stage, I had no idea what had happened. So, um, yeah, uh, I kind of got back to the finish line. I got back back to where my bag was. I saw Sinead and Brett. They were both getting a massage, and they both looked like they'd, um, you know, had really kind of tough races. They looked pretty exhausted. And then I had no idea what, yeah, Moose's result was. And then I had about five minutes to get back to the hotel to check out before um, 11 a.m. it was. I had to check out by So that's when... Thankfully, I could jump on the message group chat and you and Zach had been going back and forth for the last three hours and I could actually figure out what had been happening. I love how you have to like stop and justify to everybody why you've stopped rather than just going, yeah, thanks. <laughs> it's like, oh no, I'm actually I'm actually pacing today. I could have kept going if I wanted to. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah well, he wouldn't have liked that. Well, you know, I that. didn't want the sympathy. I'm like, thanks, but no <laughs> thanks. I'm not accepting that at this time. <laughs> <laughs> what about I'll, this? Croaks, this is the bit you'll love. So I was speaking to um, Collis the day before we had a beer together. And I said, oh, how's the room situation? He goes, yeah, I'm rooming with Brett, Brett Robinson. I'm like, oh, rough. Like, you'd think Brett Robinson might get his own room. Um, Brady, you got your own room? Oh, yeah, fuck, yeah, I got my own room. King you know, Bear, King Bear, it was very nice, yeah. The Australian record holder is here running this race. An athlete, one of the star athletes, shares a room. Brady Threlfall rocks up. Mm, two-time Sash winner. Benny Gobat, two-time premiership runner. Gets his own fucking hotel room over the, the star athletes. How yeah. bad is that? I think no. that was very much a Brett Robinson, Collis Birmingham situation. I'm pretty sure like, the Moroccan winner had his own room. I'm pretty sure most of the other guys had their own rooms. Don't know though. What, I you reckon know. they chose, they wanted to actually share a room? I reckon Benny Sane had his own room. Unconfirmed. I reckon manager and coach they just like a room together maybe. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't I think know. so. <laughs> I don't they I, I tell you they didn't like hearing about you having your own room. Sinead had, I reckon Sinead had her family, whole family up there, didn't she? So she didn't nice. have her she didn't have her own room either. Yeah. Oh not sure. Yeah. Anyway. Well just... done, Moose. You're back. You're back, yeah, Moose. Congratulations. Thanks. Well, you're on your way. You're on your way. Got one on the board. You didn't pull out anyway. No, I didn't feel like pulling out ever. That's good. I, at all. Like, I knew I was going to... On a was... day when a lot of people did, that's a good sign. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what... Look... That was the... I put in my Strava notes. I'm just like, kudos if you got to the finish line on Sunday. Like, that mm. course was difficult. The heat was difficult. Um, there would have been a lot of people having thoughts of not, not making it. Should we do the listener question now? Yeah, I've got nothing. I don't need to recap my week either. Like I pretty much just paced a thirty-two k. Moose did a good job of recapping what I was doing, and I um just did some. Yeah, I pretty much did a taper week. I just saw Achilles that I wanted to get right for that pacing job. But yeah, Croaks, 
do what is you want Achilles, Achilles good now? Or yeah, is it it's good. good. I kind of like, I had it a couple of weeks ago and then I kind of got it right. Or, and I'm like, when I said it, it was like two out of 10 and then I pretty much got it to like zero out of 10 before Burnley half. And then I did Burnley half on it and pretty much it just flared up a bit. And then I probably did that marathon workout last weekend, which flared it up again. And then I pretty much got it right all week. And then I probably flared it up a bit yesterday, but now I'll just take a week easy to get over it. Yeah. Nothing cool. in the next next couple of weeks, but just one of those ones when you put a bit too much stress from it, it just fires it up a bit. Yeah. Oh, and I'll, just recap, I'll just recap my week. So I basically ran three days. I did like 30 minutes on Monday, did the warm up with the group, 5K on Tuesday, and then 30 minutes on Wednesday and then I started I got a bit of a cold later in the week and then had the weekend of birthdays and stuff like that and so I find when um when you're unfit to start with and you know you're not sure how much running you should be doing it's much easier just to like not go for a run than when you are actually when you've got some momentum behind you and you you're borderline sick you'll go out for a run but I thought I'll stuff it so yeah I just did the three runs for the um for the week. This episode is brought to you by the running company Geelong. We are a locally owned small business that services the running community of Geelong and surrounds. We also send product to runners all over the country, so don't be shy in reaching out. Our store is staffed by experienced and passionate runners who are experts in footwear and running accessories. We have one of the largest ranges of training, racing and trail shoes in the country and provide a detailed and intuitive fitting service for all customers. On top of our shoes, you'll find apparel, watches, nutrition, socks, hats and all the other rad stuff that runners nerd out on. If you'd like to look after a small business rather than the mega companies of the world, then hit up myself, Moose, and the team down in Geelong on Instagram at the running company underscore Geelong or select Geelong at the checkout on the running Um anyway, listen to question. Hi guys, absolutely love the show and congrats to Moose on his comeback marathon. I was watching the Sydney Marathon on TV yesterday and through Barangaroo, it looked like the lead man ran up the back of the camera bike. Yes, it's flat and there are nice views of the harbour, but do you think this part of the course needs to be changed in order to become a world marathon major? From what I can tell, no other world marathon major runs on paths this narrow. Instead, they seem to be on wide open roads. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Keep up the great work. John. Can I go first? Yep. I reckon we take, living in Australia, we take Sydney as um, a bit for granted. Like I was still amazed when I first saw the bridge and first saw the opera house, how impressive they were. And this race definitely has the scenery to become a world marathon major. And if it does, they're gonna sell out. Like it's gonna be ballots, it's gonna be huge. I think what this listener question is referring to, and even the hills and stuff, I think you can have hilly world marathon majors and then like as New York is, as Boston is, and they don't have to be all flat and fast and that's where you go to run a PB. I think looking at the course, what I found, and I've only done one world marathon major, and that's Berlin, is it's like probably at least two lane roads the whole way, and you're going in the one direction. Whereas yesterday there was a lot of um, out and backs on on a road where you only really got half the road going in one direction, so it's pretty tight, and that kind of like um, path stuff around near the water was the other part where it's. It's like it's beautiful and it's scenic and I see where they're going through it, but I can only imagine how congested it would have been um, in, and that's the point he's talking about where the, they ran up the back of the motorbike. I can't imagine how congested it would have been when thousands of people are running through there um, at the same time. So I think that would be the thing they need to adjust going forward. Moose? Yeah, it's it def- that needs work for sure. And it, it's it's the same issue. It was pretty much the same paths that I saw that Sydney, the, the Blackmore's race or last year's race went through, but just in the start of the race rather than the end. Um, you remember watching mm. the finish and you're like, oh, geez, they're doing a lot of turns and they're What's going through. What's that bit called, Crux? Is it? Barangaroo. Yeah. Is it Pymouth or something like that as well? Piermont. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and so... As I was running through it, I was like, if I've watched this on TV before, and I remember thinking, this is really difficult to run, especially when you're fatigued. We got it when we were fresh. And so it definitely didn't feel as bad. And, and I, I didn't have too many problems with it at the time. Uh, but it's not major worthy. Like, it, it just can't be, a ma- like it can't be major worthy if you're on a walking path like that. It's the same thing. I've seen Amsterdam. Amsterdam Marathon's not a major. And I remember thinking that it didn't look good enough when they're running on the bike paths along the canal. I, I, I remember thinking, this is not 
the same level as the the majors. Uh, and I think if Sydney wants to, well, they will. It sounds like they're going to become one. Like everything was pretty positive from the time that we were there about it becoming one. Then they're going to have to find some roads to run on that still give the same experience, I guess. Uh, I don't, I don't care about the hills. Like the hills are not a problem to me. I don't think you have to run fast at these majors for people to come, but you, you have to, it has to be, um, there, it can't be dangerous and it can't be clustered and congested. So that's, that's probably my take is don't worry about the hills. If you have to send people over some hills, like that's okay. But if you want to take them down to Bondi to clear out, like if that's the other spot you need to hit and it's over hills, that's fine. Just don't make it on footpaths. Mm. Jimmy, um, because I did ask Jimmy from uh, Sydney Marathon about this, and they are doing a lot of construction, and he's hoping that, like, within 12 months, they can use, like, Hickson Road, which sort of is the road that runs underneath, like, um, underneath the Harbour Bridge. So hopefully they can then get off that path. But, yeah, the the bit where I saw uh, where they ran up the back of the cameraman, there was just nowhere to go because there was, like, a line of seats on one side and then sort of, like, a cliff or something on the other. And, you know... They had seventeen over seventeen thousand entries. If they're going to become a world like world marathon major, like do they have like fifty thousand in like some of the other yeah. big? Yeah, yeah so they do. Imagine like fifty thousand people like in big congested groups going through on that narrow path. Like it's yeah, it's a bit dangerous. Um, and I also find like perceived effort always feels a bit higher when you're in it on a narrow. Like it always feel, you always feel like you're running faster or it feels easier when you're on a big wide open road. Yeah. Than when you're on a bike path. It felt like a road race, like cross country race, like Moose said before. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but just that breaking in the rhythm. Um, yeah. But that's maybe it's the yeah, chicken or the egg. Well, isn't perhaps it? I just go into like, I, I just wrote down like a bunch of things I found out about it because it was like I got to experience it all. And a lot of people will be wondering about Sydney given the, the hype and the promotion. And, and it is going to like, it, it was fucking good energy there. I, I was, I felt like I was in a city that, like, I felt like I was in a Berlin for a major or Tokyo for a major. Like, that was the vibe around the city. Like, the whole city knew what was going on. Like, even the non-runners, like people in the hotel asking about it, and you could just, you could feel the energy. Um, so I thought that that was really good. Like, the city did a good job of that. Uh, I thought public transport was pretty, pretty good for the race, getting out to the expo. I know it was a little bit of an ordeal, but in retrospect it was like it was only a time thing everything like that they could control they 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 did and it was smooth um the field they did a great job putting together a, a very strong field like platinum level field for like mm-hmm. i think it was 16 guys under 2 8 maybe or 2 10 perhaps i think mm-hmm. oh, maybe i've it, got it, it here six, i can tell you i reckon it was 16 under 2 9 maybe and women was maybe 11 under 224. Yeah, it was 17 on this, on this, yeah, 17 men under 28. Yeah, that that's incredible that we're getting to see that up up close in Australia. That, that's a, like that, they've done a great job there. And then in the women's, I think it was 11. I reckon Sinead was maybe the 12th seed. Yeah, going in. there were 11 under 220, 224.51 was the slowest, but there was a lot. Yeah, 218, 217, 220, 220, 221, yeah. 23, 22, High 21, 21, yeah. High quality race. Yeah. Um, I thought the support on, on course was the best that I've had in Australia. So running, I've, I mean, I've been at Gold Coast, I've seen what that's like, and I've, I've run <laughs> Melbourne a lot. And and I I thought the the crowd spots very deep very loud uh, any the few activations they had were a bit, a bit lonely being up front and in the second half like you you're going through with only one runner the bands don't really get up and about when there's only one of you there I could imagine like later on it would be better um, the extra drink stations were really good like necessary and I thought the they were executed well at least for me i did read some stuff about how they ran out of electrolyte later in the race which was maybe a a, a bit of a, a balls up 
um, and the finish line was as good as you get. There were a few things I didn't, like I thought they could do better. Um, just like, this is a real sort of bit of a bit of a wanker one, but just the, the unclear like and late direction around the, the, the category that we were, like sub elite, I guess, or the Australian Marathon Championships. Uh, we only really found out what was going on in the last week. And um, I was having to send out a fair f- few DMs to, they, they got action pretty much straight away. But I reckon if, I reckon like you look at how Chicago does the domestic race over there, like they make a real big deal about the Australians. I mean, the Americans there. And they, they have a program where, it's like a development program where they might um, create this real buzz around the Americans running in the race. And they're not just like the Galen Rupps, but there's like a lower tier division where it could be men, like men under sub 225, they really look after and they promote like this development program to try to get them to the next level. Uh, I know there's good incentives around that. And, and I've... Um, I think the women, I can't remember what it was, maybe like women 245 or something. And I, I reckon Sydney, they have an opportunity to do that here as they grow into this major. Like if, if they really wanted to, to grow Australian marathoning, then they could, they could jump on, like include that as part of this event. And I, at the moment, it's pretty much Gold Coast with a bit of Melbourne. Uh, no one else like really does it. And no, one, no other race in Australia has the... The attraction for that whereas sydney could do it as part of this event especially if they continue that aussie only prize money like that is you know in terms of australian road running like that's really good prize money oh, yeah. um, that will keep getting a good domestic feel for sure yeah yeah well i, I, I think yeah. what sort of i think what kept maybe a few people away this year was no one knew about it till really late you know like brady for example yourself you know like if you knew that there's a chance to win five, ten thousand um, dollars. You may not run Gold Coast, and you come to Sydney instead. Yep. Yeah. But no, but no yeah. one knew. Well, it's pretty late. Tough, yeah. Yeah. Well, still, no one really knows. Like, it's not on the website or anything. Um, yeah. It's kind of hard to find, and I don't know why that is. But there's putting money up, which is really generous and great. But that it's like. It's also nice to feel wanted and special and that's why they develop programs work well because you're treated really well and they're making like they're sort of looking after that field and promoting that race and 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 wanting a lot of domestic runners to come and use chicago as their debut marathon or whatever i think that's why it works well uh, i think they i think they need to ditch the, the half and the 10 events now like if you want to be a major just like all the other races on the same day, there is only one. It's the marathon, all the big ones. And I reckon they're probably stretched a little thin trying to put on two other races while there's 17,000 people running in the marathon. And if you want to get that up to 25, 30,000, then you, you can't be putting out volunteers and, and staff and course closures and different finish lines for different races on the same morning. And it also will allow you to start the, the marathon earlier. Because at the moment, like the, the, the 10K and the half marathon started much earlier than the marathon. So they were fin- some of the half marathoners were finished 15 minutes after the marathon started. And they're running in the coolest temperatures of the day. And, and the mar- that, that should be the marathon. If you want the marathon to be the key event, then it has to be earlier. Uh, and you have to get rid of the others. Uh, we talked about the too many walking paths. There's too many U-turns. That U-turns almost as bad as walking paths for me like you've got to do everything you can to avoid them um there needed to be a few more cooling options on course so i only got to one ice station or and and by the time i got there it was it was all still hard pack ice like no one had broken it up there was just bags of ice sitting in an esky so it was better off late, later in the, the race they probably got access to that um but i didn't really get any of it and a lot of the water had been put out in the sun and so as soon as I got to, like when I got to it, the water was 20 degrees. And so it was like throwing warm bath water over your head or drinking warm, warm water. So there's probably better ways to do the heat, especially if it's going to continue at the same date. Don't think they need that last hill in the course. 
I think that's pretty brutal for a, a world major to, to chuck in that steep, like, <laughs> nasty little kicker for the majority of people who are sort of maybe doing this as their first race. It, it was just it was just hard. Maybe they keep it as a novelty or something, but at the time I didn't love it. And then, the, 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 like, the thing post-race is that as you shoot through, you wouldn't have experienced this, Brady, but once you go through the shoot, in order to get to the bag drop and the finishes, T-shirts, and um, the recovery area, you have to walk up over this hill that's really quite steep for someone who's just finished a marathon, and it's about, like, 400 metres away, I reckon, up and over a hill. And but if you, lo- but if you yeah. want to finish at the Opera House, there's not much they can do, really. Like, yeah, because it's down at the water, so you got to go in the park, don't you? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, Sydney's a hilly place, so I, I didn't I didn't worry about it. But I spoke to a couple of people who were like halfway up the hill, just stopped on the side, going, "I can't get up. I can't, I can't make it to the fucking recovery area. Like I I literally can't walk up this hill." Um, so that was pretty brutal. Whereas I felt all right at the end. But yeah, it'd be really interesting to see the changes that are made, and I'm sure they'll get feedback come in. And I, I mean, I I left more positive about the event than when I went in, so I think that's a pretty good thing. And next year they got the world uh, like age group championships. Is that oh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So mm. the, if that's a thing, do we think that's a thing though? Is it the mm. World Marathon Major Age Group Championships? Yeah. They've been having it, I think it's been London the last couple of years. And so Sydney have it next year. That could be you, Croaks. So what, what's that criteria? I don't know. I'll go I'll get hold off till I'm 45 now, Moose. I'm at the, I'm at the high end of that age group. Uh, you'll you'll uh, learn this. You'll learn Chica- this once you turn 40. in Chicago this year. Okay. And then, yeah, next year, Sydney. You need rankings. The 2023 rankings will contribute towards 2024 Age Group World Championships, which will take place within the 2024 Sydney Marathon on September 15th, 2024. Uh, so there's certain races around the world that can uh, yeah, give you points or qualify you for this championship. You need a time as well, yeah. Okay. 40 to 44, uh, Croak, is that you? Two thirty five. at the moment. Right. Yeah, yep. run 2.35. How far off of 40 are you, Moose? Boy, I'm 36. Seven this year, so I've got a while. Oh, you've plenty of time. Do you win? You're so young, aren't I, Chris? I'm a, well, yeah, but Brady's even younger than you. It's making me feel real old. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm starting to think that I'm almost 45. But he yeah. looks pretty old. I reckon he looks older than us. Who? You. Me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you. Okay. Thought I looked like a bit of a little kid, so I'll take that. Nah, you're just the size of a little kid. Aging a bit. The size, but not the looks. Like, your head gives it away. Okay. Yeah, must start moisturising or something. Are we going to do the results from Sydney? Yeah, and then go to eh? Patreons? Spoke about yeah. everything else about Sydney, so I'll go keep going. Go, oh, who's this colour? Moose. Oh, yeah, I'll do the results then. So um, the winner was off, the winner of the males was Othman Al Gumri. He went 208 20. Now, I got a few DMs after this during the afternoon saying this bloke's popping up as a uh, doper. Served a doping ban, apparently. I didn't Google it or look into it, but Ali was quick onto it. And two she's years. Like, two years, I think, he was suspended for. Yeah, did In two 2016. years. In 2016. So, Dude, not ideal for the race, I don't reckon. But not if you, ideal. If you do your time, though. Mate, it's different, though. Like, Should just be done for life. It's not like... Mm. Um, like, running's a privilege. It's not a right. Like, oh, well, I don't know. I, I feel like... If you cheat through doping, I don't know the story of this bloke, but he's done uh, two years, right? Irregularities in his biological passport. So it's one of those ones where I guess hasn't like tested positive for anything, but the biological passport, there's a few anomalies there, which is enough to then uh, have someone suspended. Plead guilty? Is that why uh, he got two years, first four? Don't know. He ran 205 at Barcelona. He was second there this year in March. Yeah, so he's he's back. Uh, is he running faster now than when he was doping? That's the question. Yeah, that was his PB. 205? 205 from this year and the national record of Morocco. Yeah, I mean, look, he's been found guilty for doping. Or no, he's, re- yeah. 
for the it, elite. What is, is it? Irregularities. Irregularities yeah. in a blood biological profile. Pa- biological yeah. passport. Yeah, he's raced uh, all over the world though since then. Yeah, yeah. Raced okay. in America. So, raced to the world it's still champs not a great last year. Look. It was twelve. It's, it's still not a great look. Let's be real. I know, like, but when does it? Like, where, do you ever forgive these guys? Or are um, you suggesting it should be life bans? These guys shouldn't get to compete. Like uh, he went to the I, Olympics. Not, he went to Sapporo and was ninth. <laughs> I'm just saying, I reckon the Sydney Marathon fellas are sitting there going, fuck, I just wish one of the other boys won today. <laughs> like, it, the, the thing is, no one Googled him. Like, the media are in getting behind it, and so everyone's kind of just blind eyeing it. It's like, all right, well, fair enough. He served his ban. I guess he's back. But if it was a high-profile doping case, I don't think we're looking at it like that, are we? No. There's, always going to be que- there's always going to be question marks now. Well, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> second place was Laban Career in 208.43. And third was Getanay Mola Tamare, 211.22. So who was the 2 3 man? Wasn't it Mola? There was a few 2 3 guys. It was um, uh, Gia from Tanzania. Was he second or third at Boston? Oh, yeah. He, he was, was the big one, he was the headliner. Who was in yep. the red, Brady? Or oh, Croaks, when you're watching. Big tall guy in the red. Mm, Kibet last don't... year's winner was there as well. Don't know. But this guy that finished um, third, yeah, he's run 203.34 in Dubai 2019. Yeah, that was yeah, Mola. Damn. Yeah. So you got a 2-3 bloke running 2.11. How crazy is that? Well, imagine if you said to those boys on the start line, like, hey, I know you're all going at 63 pace. But I've uh, I've looked ahead into the future, and two eleven twenty two is going to get you third. Yeah. Or <laughs> well, if you said to Brett Robinson, "Hey, FYI, Brett, you can be eighth if you run two twenty three today." Yeah. I got yeah. finished um fourteenth as well at World Cross this year. Got finished third. Oh yeah. Yeah right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, in the Aussie Championships for men, Brett Robinson, she uh, he run two twenty three of five eighth place. Menzies, Dean Menzies, he had a great race, I thought, 223.37. He's actually run even there too. I think he, or maybe a slight negative split perhaps. I thought that was really impressive because he did that by himself nearly the whole way. Um, and Tommy, he ran off on me, he ran 224.27. I think he just ran, he ran 70.14 or something, I reckon it was, or even no, less. Uh, 13, 70.13 for his second half of his race. It's pretty good off uh, not a <laughs> not a lot of running, not, not an amazing prep. A lot of talent there, isn't there? A lot of talent wasted on Tommy. Valencia, I believe. He's, oh, uh, is he? He, he, well, I think he's got a bib for Valencia. Yep. Oh, okay. Mm. Look, he was looking strong. And as he ran off of me, I'm like, I know this bloke's training. This is bullshit. How is he doing this? <laughs> Uh, it's what happens when you're a 62 man. You can do whatever you want off a 74 minute half. It, it, it just feels easy. In the ladies, as you mentioned, Betsy Sina was first place. She was a US athlete, 226.47. Rama Chota ran 226.53. And Gladys Chessy Chep Tagilai ran 228.41. Uh, as you were watching this race unfold, Brady, did you find like some of the women were stronger and wanting to be at the front more than others? Yeah, I thought Korea, like I think she was the race favourite as well. Her and Tanui, like they both got a P, but they were too fast as with 217 high and 218 low. So like I, you, you kind of say you get a look at it, but it's very much like turn your head, make sure there's a female group there and then look back on the road. So you're not paying too much attention. But Korea had like the longer kind of braids and the, the uh, Nike Rosa orange kid on so she was pretty easy to spot and yeah. i thought she was if you asked me when i um yeah at 20k at 25k i was like yeah she's like i thought we went through in 74 and i'm like this girl's ran 217 high and then to 218 low i'm like this must feel like they're jogging but then yeah i was amazed like they jogged it in in the end like they both weren't top three um but yeah i'm gonna say i've got a, got the results here um like what were they in the end Career was um, one was one was two twenty eight 
and uh, one was like two thirty four. Yeah, and then Tanui pretty much just held the pace two twenty eight fifty two. So and she was fourth in the end. Um, but yeah, I was expecting like huge kickdowns. But other than those first two, who kind of did that one or two k surge to break the pack, they kind of yeah, they still ran pretty solid over the second half. Yep. All right. Well, in the ladies' race, Sinead won eight two thirty one. Uh, we had I had some beers with Sinead. Was she there when you were there? With the beers, or did she just come after Brady? No, I must have missed her. Oh yeah, so she was there. She had a bad. Um, I think she had some gut issues. And that she was just off the pack actually the whole way <laughs> maybe until they started to kick down a bit but i remember looking around at a couple of turns early i'm like gee Sinead's like on the back of our pack i thought she was supposed to be well off uh but then the pace was so slow that it made sense that she was there and so she got a fairly good sniff of the race ended up finishing eighth i guess so would have caught a ton in the second half um kate mason was second what, and she was 11th in the race, 2 hours 40. And Kate Baker was 12th, 2 hours 46, third in the Australian champs. Um, in the more important race, the all I know is the men's team event. Sure. Queensland actually won the, the national championship. <laughs> uh, I, I forget the, their athletes, who they had. Sorry, that's oh, come bad. On, mate. You can't get rolled by them and not know their names. <laughs> Second place was Victoria. It was Brett, myself, and then third was Matt Gunther. So he's pulled pulled out third place. He gets a medal. He stopped on the sideline for 20 minutes or more and jogged in with his sister and his mate in three hours 20, maybe. Well, so you had no other, like, Victorians registered? No, no we team. didn't. They had no to one. be in the state team. Yeah, no, they were in the state team. But they they didn't finish, or they finished be, below that. So there was John Ma. I'm not sure what happened to John Ma. Simon Hans pulled out. Matthew Schemberger also pulled out. Also pulled out. And then you, you're left with myself, Brett, and Gunther. I reckon there was a c- couple more Brady who were in that team. Uh, anyway, maybe only six. Yeah. Probably should stop talking about this, given that the third place Victorian was Gunther, who stopped on yeah, for thirty minutes and right. over three hours. Let's um, move on. That's right. Got a yeah, national right. medal though. <laughs> national medal. Half marathon was really kind of a weak field. Yushu Nakatsu won in sixty-eight oh five in the women. Yuko Yumeki seventy-seven minutes in the ten k. Ed Goddard won twenty-nine eighteen, and Neve Allen was the winner of the females in thirty-three thirty. All right, good recap of Sydney. It's only gone for 80 minutes. <laughs> yeah. but, hey, um, it's it's our major. It's going to be our world major. Yeah, it was good. Some good stories out of the weekend, and congratulations again. Crokes, want to thank some Patreon supporters, then we'll flick back to some more running news. Yeah, so we've got Clark Hunt. Uh, Clark lives in London, has run 17.19 for 5K when he finished second in this year's Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park 5K, 36.25 for 10K, uh, which was done at Battersea Park. 78 minutes at the Cambridge Half Marathon, and he ran 3.04 at last year's Valencia Marathon. So thanks for your support, Clark, and all the best if you're gearing up for Valencia again this year. Who you got, Moose? Yep, I got Josh Ford from Sydney. He has run 18.33 at the Rhodes Park Run, 10K at 39.43 for the Sydney 10. Uh, was that this year? Yeah, I think so. yep. All right, we'll pay that then. That was legit. <laughs> Half marathon, 129.11, New South Wales half marathon champs. And he's a senior data analyst in the federal government. Gee. Oh, big title, isn't it? Some white collar, white collar athletes out there, aren't they? <laughs> I'm going to thank Gabrielle Dennison. He's from uh, Hobart, has ran 403 for the 1500, 8.51 for 3K, 15.54 for 5K, and 3245 at last year's Launceston 10K. Pick one of those, Moose. Oh, uh, 851, 1550. 403. 403, maybe, yeah. Yeah, I'm paying 403. The 5 and there. 10 are pretty consistent, yeah. Yeah, 403. Um, he f- travelled to Europe early this year and won the Bushy Park Run, which was the first ever park run to ever start up in Bushy Park there in uh, Teddington, isn't it? Um, he ran 16 16. So that'd be cool to say you've won that one. They'd get four or five hundred there every week, wouldn't they, Croaks? 
I guess so, yeah. Bit of kudos, I reckon, really, yeah. for that one. A few scalps there. Thank you to all our Patreon supporters who support the show. The uh, the last episode of Road to Berlin is this week with Jimmy, Paddy and Rob. And then they'll be uh, racing, obviously, Sunday. And then the recap show, yeah, next week. And then our new Road to series, which is pretty close to being locked in. Um, we'll start after that. Get early access. What else do you get? The uncut version of the show every week. And, um, yeah, all those other details at patreon.com forward slash inside running podcast. Let's talk about some uh, Diamond League. Bradley, the final is on over two days in Eugene, Oregon. You've been all over this. I've, yeah, I've caught bits and pieces. I did hear the, we were kind of 10 minutes, 20 minutes from the start line, I reckon. And then everyone started talking about um, Lyndon Hall. Yeah, it's actually one of the, like, we knew it was on this weekend, but I feel like um, Sydney Marathon sort of, took centre stage and, and even like I've, I've been watching it all year and this was the first time that I haven't like got up the next morning and watched it so I, I actually knew some of the results before I'd actually watched it um that being said it was both days from a distance point of view were amazing like the races were fast and also really close so I whipped through them men's 800 um when Yonyi got the win, 142.8, which was a world-leading time, he beat AROP, who's been you know the form athlete this year. Um, AROP ran 142.85, which is a national record for Canada. And Sajadi um, was third, 143.06. Uh, in the women's, Athing Mo, um, she got the win, 154.97, which is a world lead and a US record. Keely Hodgkinson was second, 155.19, which is a UK record. And um, Gould Toppen uh, was 31.55.96, which was also a national record for Jamaica. Uh, Cat Bissett, six in 158. Now, question for you boys. Now, how do you make the Diamond League final? You get enough points at the Diamond League throughout the year to make the final. And yep. then potentially they give a wild card to the world champ or Olympic champion of that year. Yeah, I, I thought yeah, I thought it was more points system, but then yeah, Athen Moe's done like pretty much no diamond leagues at all, and then just comes in for the final. So I'm not sure. Like I like the idea of like qualifying for this and maybe not having the the wild cards. Thoughts, Moose? Nah, wild card. Wild cards are there for the the show, mate. You gotta mm. you gotta get the best in. Yeah. Although the what the diamond league final should be the world championships in my mind. Like, I don't get why there's both. Because it, it, these guys should be peaking for one race. I don't think you, you want some peaking for a Diamond League, some peaking for a World Champs, and some trying to, like, join the dots in between. Mm. I, 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 they, there's got to be a way that the Diamond League and the World Champs links up somehow. Uh, I don't know how they do it, but I kind of... I feel like the World Champs is a grand final and we need a rest after it. Yeah, which that, that's why some of these results have surprised me because most years you see athletes sort of fall away after the major championship, whereas based on here, like people are actually running faster at the end of the season um, after the major championship. So uh, move on to the 1500. Uh, Faith Kipiagon got the win in the women's 350. Dereba Wateji, she got second, 353. And Laura Muir was third in 355. Uh, Lyndon Hall broke her own Australian record and became the first female to break 357 in the 1500 metres. She finished fifth overall, um, and Jessica Hull was eighth in 357.57. Um, pretty wow. impressive, because she mm. was she was back in, like, maybe seven. So she sort of just was off, not off the back, but just um, she was well behind, like, she was behind um, Jess Hull uh, for, you know, up until probably 300 to go. Um, so she closed really well in that last lap. So, um, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Definitely. Getting down there now. They just swapped that record too, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, Lyndon, yeah, yeah. So Lyndon had this one. Um, yeah, it was like three fifty-seven low. Um, so good, oh, good way to yeah, end right. the season. Yeah, yeah so, so Lyndon already Lyndon already had this one. I so Hull's starting to Hull's starting to almost like be the longest specialist here, like with her three Ks and her five Ks. Mm. Is, are you starting to feel like Hall's owning her a little bit? In I mean, yeah, Hall is owning her a little in the um, 15. Mate, well, I guess Lyndon's now run two times that are faster than Jess's best. Um, 
Jess is probably a bit more consistent. Like she's run 357, I don't know how many times this season, whereas Lyndon will have the odd run where she'll run like 401 and then she'll come out and run 356. Um, whereas Jess, yeah, you always know what you're going to get with Jess. Hull. Yeah. Um, all right, Bauman Mile. Uh, this was quite fascinating. Came down to Jakob versus Yara Nagus, um, and Inga Britson got the win, 343.73 which is 0.6 off the world record. Um, Nagus was 343.97, um, which is a new American record, and George Mills was third in 347.65. Stewie finished 10th, 349.32, and um, Reynold Chariot broke the under-20 world record, running 348. And there's yeah, five national records in that race. Um, do you guys see any of this? Yeah, I've just quickly watched the highlights and kind of skimmed through it. Yeah, like, he didn't have it his own way. Like, Nagus was definitely, like, challenging down the straight. Um, but, yeah, to be, what, point you six? You reckon? It's still well, significant. But, but well, I guess what was impressive was the times that they were running, the fact that Jakob was point six off the world record and there's somebody that's on his shoulder. Yeah. Like, you know, he lost by, what, point two five of a second. So, yeah, it's not like... It's not, well, it wasn't like, photo, it's, wasn't it's not like a photo the 3K. Finish. The 3K, I actually yeah. I thought Kajelcha had beaten him. Yeah, yeah. So we'll move on to that one. Um, I think this was originally set up to have a bit of a crack at the world well, record. but What yeah. about Stewie? And, like Stewie's result, how were we rating that? Uh, well, I think that combined with the 3K that we're about to talk about shows that um, he's, he's, he's rounding into good form at the end of the season. Yeah. Like, I, think it, I think it's pretty good. Three forty nine point three two for tenth, and I think back. I think backing it up the next day with his three k, which we'll talk about, yeah. shows that he's he's he there, there or thereabouts. He's there at five hundred to go. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. Do you know what's hard for me when I see these results is the couple of years ago when he ran three fifty, pretty much solo, at Penguin, just one random afternoon at a Shield <laughs> event or Tasmania, something. Tasmania, yeah. And now he's at the Diamond League final, and there's guys. Nine guys in front of him to mm. chase down, and he's running 0.7 of a second quicker. Yeah. Well, I think the the rest of the world's definitely caught up the last couple of years. Um, and we we mentioned that a while back with Ollie. You know, like Ollie w- was one of the top guys last year, and now he'll go to some of these races, and he'll be like third or fourth in his in his tra- training group because there's you know now you've got like a dozen guys now that are all around that same level, other than maybe Ingebrigtsen just a little bit ahead of ahead of them. Yeah. Um, which makes for you know makes for exciting racing. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, the three K they went out sort of as if they were going to have a crack at the world record. Ingebrigtsen and then pretty much just slowed it down a little bit, sort of controlled the race. But everybody was just lining up right behind him. And any time somebody sort of went to make a move, he really just controlled it. So like if somebody was about to make a move down the straight, he'd accelerate to make sure that you know they had to run further around the bend and that sort of stuff. Uh, came down to him versus um, Kajelcha, 723.63, uh, which was a national record for him and the third fastest all time. Kajelcha, 723.64, so one hundredth of a second splitting them. Uh, Kajelcha now goes to fourth on the all time list. And Grant Fisher was third in 725.47, which was a US national record. Um, Stewie was 731.14, season's best, and yeah, three seconds about three seconds off his Australian record. So um, I think that's a pretty good double for, for Stewie, 349 into 731. Yeah. It's a good weekend, sure. isn't it? Yeah. For sure. He, um, can't control, he can't control these other guys getting so good. Yeah. And he's coming off an interrupted sort of season. So hopefully, like, it, it, it's a real momentum builder for next year. Yeah, 100%. Like, what we need, you yeah, know, basically is no hiccups between now and, you know, what's the first Diamond League next year? It's always, um, is it like Doha or something like that? Or even just, like, don't even go for that and look mm. at Paris. Like, is it sustainable to start that season so early and, and still run the Olympics? I don't know. Yeah. It's, it should be all about Paris from now on. Should be. Race of the weekend, women's 5K. Um, so... Had a couple of Bowman track club athletes, um, Sinclair Johnson and Elise Cranny. They paced up until 2K. And then um, 
Halem, who ran the 1500 the day before, she also paced the 3K. That left Sege and Beatrice Chibet um, to battle it out basically for the win. And, um, yeah, Sege ran 14 flat point two seconds to take, like, five seconds off the world record. Um, Beatrice Chibet was second in 14.05.92, so that was a little bit slower than the old world record. And Tay was third in 14.21. Um, amazing boys, like, so close to that sub-14 minute barrier being broken. Um, incredible. Yeah. yeah, she looked great doing it too. What I'm looking forward to now next season is her versus Kip Yagon in the 5K. Because you'd think that Faith's going to – well, she's already stepped up and had a – you know, she's only done like that one 5K. But as she gets older, you think she's going to become even better at the 5K. So these two going head-to-head next year, um, they'll – both of them will break 14 minutes next year. How, how old's Kip Yagon? Uh, let me tell you. And how um, old's Seagay? Kip Yagon's way older than Seagay. Kip, Kip Yagon's 29. And Seagay um, is... Where is she? 26. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Thought it was a bigger yeah. gap than that. Yeah. So anyway, that'll be that'll be pretty good next year. Uh, Steeple, to be honest, I didn't watch these, so these <laughs> these are the results. Uh, Winifred Yavi got the win in the women's 850, a world lead and an area record. Beatrice Chepkowicz second 851, and Faith Cheritic was third in 859. Simon Kowicz won the men's in 806. Samuel Firewu was second in 810, and Geordie Beamish third in 814. Um, I was surprised that. To, like none of the big dogs in the men's were there, so El Bacali and um, uh, Germa. Yeah. Well, why there. wouldn't they be there? Yeah, I don't know. Don't know. Big money, isn't made, it? Made enough, made enough cash for the year already, I guess. Yeah, that makes no sense. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's the dime. That's the end of the Diamond League for the year. Good work, Crook. Sure, over that quickly. Go. You love that, don't you? He do love the he? Diamond League. Yeah, it's not bad. Like, yeah, I like, yeah, especially with, like exciting races like that and world records and yeah. You're like, you're like a diamond league nuffy. <laughs> you're like Brady well, for the football. Well, someone has to cover it. Like, yeah. we... we need someone on the show that's taking. No, that I much love interest. it. I yeah, like it. that's good. I love, it. love that shit. Oh, I, I don't get up for it. I don't think I'm that much of a footy nuffy though, Moose. Uh, well, you tried. You're just the nuffy part of it. You're not like the like the knowledgeable yeah, part. I don't know much about what's going on. I just hope my team wins and that's it. Well, well, I guess Moose. I ran track a lot longer than I run road yeah. races. Yeah, yeah, we can. T- I can tell you love it. Like you can talk about it better than we can. Yeah, you're good at that, Crooks. I'll take you to the real Realize and tell you about something I do love. <laughs> um, the Bendigo Bats had a big win. 67.50 over Western Athletics, uh, 68.37. And Mentone on the podium, which was good, 68.56. Fastest times of the day. Our boy, Seth O'Donnell from Mentone, he ran 10.37. Um, our other boy, Andy Buchanan, second fastest time, 10.52. And then uh, Dale Carroll from Box Hill was 10.58. In the women's result, uh, Box Hill won 65.56. Glenn Huntley was second in 67.05. St. Stephen's third, 68.21, which means Glenn Huntley do win the premiership uh, for 2023. Fastest times, Sarah Billings, 12.09. Morty Skyring, 12.28. And Melissa Duncan, 12.36. Didn't hear much about Tan Relays when I was up in Sydney, Moosh. Much across your desk. Uh, boys hats. were celebrating. Do you know what was celebrated? What was that? Women's women's Geelong team, Div 2 Premiers, into their Premiership division next year. Don't be don't be uh, surprised if we start reading out a few Geelong results next mm, year. Hopefully in the women's. Was there a Mad Monday, Moose, today for them? Uh, I'm not sure what, whether they're planning something. It could get pretty loose, I reckon, the girls. The Bendigo boys are still going, I think. They, were, they had some eskies on the bus home and had a good go at it. Yeah, that would be fun. I'm not sure the girls are that, like, crass. They might go out for dinner or something. Maybe, dress, like, you know. Start Mad Monday stuff. Five-star restaurant stuff. Can the bats go three in a row, you reckon, Croaks? Can't believe uh, we're even talking yeah. about back-to-back. Can you? I, I reckon. Because you guys probably just... Um, no, 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 it's not, not right to say you, you guys care more. <laughs> um, yeah, because I'm sure well, there's other. It's true. <laughs> I, don't, I yeah. only did six this year, I think. Maybe five. 
you guys I think got we've just got more depth. You got some good depth, yeah. yeah. And yeah. and you're not depleted as much by international athletes running overseas. Yeah. Because Ooh. if you had if you had some of those other clubs, oh, like, like who? St. Stevens. Well, who else? They, they don't even exist, overseas, mate. Yeah. They're gone. Yeah. They're out, aren't they? But yeah. if they had their if they had their everybody who runs overseas, if they weren't overseas and they were here and they were running AV, would they beat the bats? Who? Bucks and Stewie. Who Just, else? Nah, you need a good 10, 15. Mm. They're like six. So I think they're thinking about next year calling it uh, the season campaign. Campaign's going to be bat trick. As in like hat trick, but you change it to bat. Yeah. All right, move on. Yeah. Uh, City to Bay happened. This was the Australian Road Racing Championships over there. Twelve K. Jack Rayner done his thing. He won in thirty two twenty four. Zach Faccioni wasn't far behind though. Thirty four thirty two. And Isaac Heen was third in thirty four fifty two. In the women's, Jen Gregson got another win on the road in thirty eight thirty nine. Susanna Davy was second in 39.05, and Audrey Irish was third in 39.08. Um, boys, what do you know about Susanna and Audrey? Because I think that's the first time I've ever read those names out on this show before, but not that far behind Jen in over 12K. Yeah, I've, uh, I've never heard of them before. Yeah. Moose? No, sorry, never have. This is an Australian championship. Mm. Well, yeah. Australian road running championships on the same day as the Australian marathon championship. Well, they were run pretty quick times. Well, I'm not saying I'm not saying that they're not like Where legitimate winners. Where these two ladies come from? This is a much better achievement than uh, Vic winning the um, the marathon yeah. <laughs> team <laughs> team uh, uh, so, medal. Yeah, like um, are they Adelaide runners? I don't know. Ali pulled out last minute, Moose, because wasn't she yeah. that one? Little niggle, little niggle, not worth it. Just doing some research and found her job, if it's the right person. But no, no world athlete. You sure these are right results, Crocs? Well, no world athletics profile. I'm anyway. pretty sure they're the result. Well, I'll click click on that link again. Anyway, that's right. Um, in the half marathon, Alistair Christie is a uh, AV boy. Runs for Box Hill. He ran 65.01 to get the win there. Tiana Setter was first female in 79, uh, sorry, 76, sorry, 35. So no one doubled up for that 10,000 bucks. Didn't see any of that happening. Um, you know what, Brady, with these results, no, so I clicked, go. well, no, so <laughs> I've, I'm, on their, I'm on their website and I clicked this morning on like results and that's where I got them from. And now I've clicked on that same link again and it's got official results coming soon. Okay. Which, Ooh. um, that's one criticism. Like, City Bay is a pretty big event. And to be able to not, like, find the results, you know, more than 24 hours after the event is pretty poor. Um, because I, I can't find them now. Did Athletics Australia put anything on there? Oh, yeah, here we go. Yeah, Caitlin Adams second, Crooks. Yeah, well, Caitlin there you go. That's, that's why they've taken these results down, obviously. 39, yeah. 12, 34. And Tara Brain was third in 42.45, so a bit of a gap back to Tara there. But Caitlin Adams, I bought stock in her at the start of the mm. year. Now she comes second in Australian Road Racing uh, Champs, and we weren't going to read it out. Did you find Susanna Davey or Audrey Irish in there? No, I didn't. And if you're listeners to the show, we'll <laughs> thank you. Um, and, yeah, apologies that we got those results wrong there. Keep training hard, and hopefully you're on the podium next year. Keep going. The times are even um, different. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, that was that. Moose on the loose before we finish this show up. Yeah, I've got a good one, boys. It's come across my desk, and I had to do a little bit of research, which is like the last two or three minutes. He's um, having about about these people. Oh, oh, always get worried. A, a bit worried. Yes, yeah, so. good worried. <laughs> And I'm not going to mention any names. Feel free to DM me, and I'm going to send you the name just so you can uh, you're aware of it. But we're not going to do that to uh, to anybody to our like large listener database. But Having a beer on Saturday, Sunday evening down in Bondi with my uh, friend Matt and, and Gus. And Gus, he follows a few Instagram accounts and there's one running, oh, it's going to say, he said running influencer. I'm not sure how much influence they have. But he said, oh, we follow him. He uh, just posted something about his time. Didn't really match up with what I saw in the results. Check the Strava some proper discrepancies going on here. So 
to cut like this whole story short, the finish on the Strava of this athlete, it looks like the the finish, like the the the, the run has been cropped um, to show the finish line, like the finish of Strava at forty two point two, but when you actually look at the finish of where this is being cropped to, it's it's like about the 41 or the 40K mark, I reckon it might be. Um, or maybe it would be a little bit closer to the finish than that. Uh, but the, the, the estimated, the moving time on this run uh, does not link up with the elapsed time and it definitely doesn't link up with the gun time or the net time. So there's been a little bit of handiwork done on the Strava to to make it look a lot better than what it actually was. How do you even do that, Moose? Because I noticed you did that last week. You tied it up one of your Strava yeah, your I did. cool down <laughs> yeah. after, I, uh, after, I got 100, after I got 100, 111 <laughs> likes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then it was confusing because I didn't see it till later. And I'm like... <laughs> Why is you gotta yeah, it just didn't make sense for people who didn't see it in yeah, real so time. For those <laughs> for those that are listening, Moose's cool down had I could run like a I think a three forty nine mile and a eight oh two yeah. two mile. I got in the car, I yeah. forgot to stop my watch, I drove down the street. <laughs> I gathered that, so I wrote, yeah. Oh, this is you know, basically congrats on the sub four minute mile. Things are looking good for Sunday <laughs> if this yeah, that's right, because your title at that time was four times five minutes at marathon yeah, yeah. effort. I'm like, this is this is promising if this is marathon effort, and then you obviously cropped it. So how do you even do that, Moose? Yeah, you can crop your run just for the exact the exact reason why <laughs> What I just did, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but this one looks like you can go into the file and you can crop the GPX. So to finish um, at a different point than when you actually stop your watch. Okay. So it's just so dodgy. Like, it's all right to be slow or have a shit day or whatever. But you just don't need to be, like, deceptive about it to people. I don't like that at all. Um, They're meant to and- be over. That's the thing. As well, yeah, like, what do you get? Forty-two point five eight. Uh, That's probably not, pretty good. I, it doesn't matter. We're talking fucking world, mate. We're platinum, know, right? Yeah, trust them, not your watches. That's the point I'm making. So yeah, you have to go in and crop it to make it forty-two point two k on your watch, and then put that on your Instagram and just yeah. So now I'm just I, Who's I got need the to time go for that. But what I don't yeah. get, Moose, is like you put that on social media and people like give you extra kudos because you're faster than what you actually ran but deep down you know that you didn't run it anyway so no. how does it make you feel good about yourself ah, when you get the likes croaks but, exactly but, when the you, likes but, come but, in, in but if i'm getting likes for something dopamine. that i know i didn't but but if i'm getting likes for something that i know i didn't do that doesn't get me up and about yeah wouldn't sit well with me either <laughs> yeah but it's it's happening out there and it's a thing we did, we 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 did gloss over a very good quote from um, Sinead Diver in in her pre-race media uh, for Sydney Marathon. She was on the front page of the was it Sydney Morning Herald or it was one, a Daily Telegraph, one of the new Sydney yeah, papers. Yeah, Sydney Morning Herald. Yeah, and she um, she pretty much said, "Oh, the running world popularizes influences over the actual athletes, and we need to tell the story of the athletes better." Than the actual non-running influences. That was, and I love that. Was um, that in that newspaper article? I'm pretty sure it was in that article. Yeah. Because I know or, she said similar stuff in the Athletics Australia article. Oh, maybe it, is it not the same thing? No, nah, Lockie Morehouse wrote the Athletics Australia one. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, my bad then. Um, so what you're saying, Moose, is you're more happy about getting a win over Ned Brockman than you were about winning five thousand dollars. Well, I thought it, it would be interesting <laughs> considering she was sharing the um stayed with Ned Brockman in the media conference. <laughs> and, yeah. and Ned Brockman got announced uh, before Brett and Sinead did as the, the bigger um, the bigger personality or the, the more important guest. Wasn't uh, his title, though, Australian Hero? Yeah, I saw that written Australian, somewhere. Yeah. Marathon but, runner and Australian Hero. Yeah, you uh, sent it through, Brady. Yeah, I'm on the me- I get the media emails. Mm. Wow. You know, his record got beaten on the weekend, too. No, we oh, didn't yeah. talk about that. Fuck, we were going to do... Because this bloke about... actually did break the record. He didn't break the record. No, I think uh, Ned missed it by like three days, and this guy beat Ned by about six days. Let's so pay beat, that. Beat, beat the record by like three days or something. I've, I've heard the name before too. Um, mm. 
I know that Pace Athletic, the uh, retail group, they should put it on their social media. Um, Scott someone. I th- was it Scott someone? Chris someone. Yeah, yeah hang on. I'll find it. Um, it'll yeah. be up here. We should pay that, I reckon, because that, that's actual someone who, like, doesn't go out there and do it for their... Oh, like, yeah, his profile is tiny compared to... money and all that. Yeah. Don't think he had Chris, a marketing team Chris around Chris Turnbull him. was his name? Chris Turnbull, yeah. Good on him. So he well, runs one, one side yeah. straight out of the other. Yeah. How long did it take him, Croaks? Uh, I think he did it just under, four, like, 40 days. 30, it was like 39 or 40 days, and I think Ned was like 46. Yeah. Love that. Good on you, Chris. What's mm. coming up? A few things to look out for, fellas. Berlin Marathon's this uh, this Sunday. Kipchoge, he's going to win it. What kind of time is he going to run? Ooh. Uh, Throw something out there, Chris. We're going to say world record, yes or no? No world record. Moose, world record? Nah, no way. I feel like he's on the he's on the decline. Police aren't very no. confident. Nah, I'll go 2-0-3-30. Will he win? Yeah, probably. Be set up for him to win it, I reckon. Liam Adams is there. Been in Font Ramon. Is that how you say it, Croaks? Font Ramon? Yeah, he's been up there training, altitude training. He could do anything off the back of his Gold Coast. Are you calling Australian record? (laughs) Oh, mate, yeah. What's the weather meant to be? Oh, he nearly did it at um. He was on pace for a long time at Gold Coast. Yeah, you've done, well, he was, you've he done was, Berlin. You've done Gold Coast. You know which ones? Oh, my, no, I haven't done. Mm. I haven't oh, done Gold know, Coast. You know what Gold Coast like though. You've Berlin is fucking minute at least. Mm. Yeah. At least that is an, a racetrack. I reckon there's well, if he's in the same What's shape. The weather look like. I, look, on the website I'm on is low of 12, top of 20. Oh, um, nice. If that, if Liam's in the same shape that he was for Gold Coast. Then I reckon there's more chance of an Aussie record going down than a world record. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You want to slab on it? If he's no. been trained at altitude, haven't don't take much. it, Croaks. Nah, don't take so, that. All loopy <laughs> until the slab gets put on. <laughs> Wait. So you reckon he, you reckon he will break the Aussie record? Brayden? Is that where you were taken? <laughs> which, which one do you? What, what do you think? Do you reckon he'll break it or not? Yeah, I reckon he'll break it. Okay. Oh no, I'll take it. You don't think I'll, he will I'll break get, it? Yeah, yeah. I'll take done. Slab. Why not? Done. All right, let's do it. All right. We're on. Liam well, Adams breaking Australian record. Tara Palms also in action there. Her marathon debut. Um, and that's about all we've got for what's coming up. A bit of that's, a, not her, that's not her debut, isn't it? No, she ran. She ran. Um, didn't she win Adelaide the other week? Yeah, as a trainer run. Well, oh, for you can't do that. Oh. You She's can't do that. Didn't she do a workout for Berlin? Coming up? What? I think so. She That's won what... the. We we said that she won the Adelaide Marathon. Yeah, that... it was it was a planned workout for nah, Berlin nah, a nah, month nah, later. You still run the marathon? No, not that if you're is... not having a crack at it. That's your debut. Yeah, that's no, your I debut. disagree. I disagree. You put the bib on and no. you run the marathon and you collect the prize money. No, it's okay. You're just going to compromise that your debut marathon is over. No, when you first tow the line and you're going to race the whole thing. No, that's booked. Well, so that's what about not, okay? No, no. What, what about this then? If you you're doing your first marathon, you go do a run like a long workout, and you do forty three k. Is that no. your debut marathon? No, it isn't. Why not? You run the distance. It's, it's not your marathon, is it? But it's what, training. What's, run. what's to stop everybody who does? So if, if you don't run the time that you want to run, even if you've raced it, you just say, "Oh no, it was just a training run today." Brady, but that's what Brady, it was. It was well documented. That's what she was doing going into yeah, the yeah. race. Yeah, yeah, she may have, but that's she still... got paid to do a workout. Why not do it? No, but you've still ended a race and you've still done a marathon. Like it's same, not a debut marathon. same shit as DNFing. That's your fucking debut still. All right, you well, don't get to have another crack later. Yeah, on. I, I agree with you. But the, how do you? The how argument do we... is here: the intention oh, no. on the start line. Oh. If you're going to do your debut and go over the other side of the world, and then you put all your eggs in that basket, and then you DNF, like, you got to write a disclaimer before you start. Well, I think you don't have to write or it, but like write it at the end. these Australian like level runners, we know when they're doing a marathon series and when they're not. Oh, do you want to do an Instagram is, poll on it? Nice. All right, look, you can uh, give me right, another slab. I'm happy to say that it's her her first like serious yeah, crack attempt. It. Yeah, but it's not her debut. It is her debut. Let's what's do an it, Instagram what, poll on yeah. this. What, what's I'm happy de- with that. What's I'm... the definition of debut, Brady? Having a crack at the marathon seriously. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, no, no, that, no. That's what it is in a Chukamoa at my place anyway. <laughs> that's two slabs. Here we go. Debut noun. 
a person's first appearance or performance in a particular capacity or role. Exactly. A person's first appearance. Appearance or capacity or in a role. of ha- Yeah, performing appearance. it in the role, not just performing it to do oh. a workout. No, you're off here. I think a lot of people agree with me there. This is up there with your penguin in a, is a fish. That was oh. off Google. I just read that off Google <laughs> that night. That's it. Ugh. I reckon I'm right there, fellas. Just because there's two voices against one, I think the listeners are going to be on my side. Um, no wonder you bloody claimed your half marathon PB for years when you did it behind a truck in Moama. I didn't never claim that as a PB, did I? Uh, Croaks, having a beer with my mate at, on the weekend. And do you know what the, the best call of the day was? When he, he called um, Brady a glorified babysitter because he was a primary school teacher. Uh, <laughs> Croaks. Oh. Croaks, the guy's I fucking loved it. I and then Croak was, was uh, this guy was also a school teacher. At high school. <laughs> yeah, high, high school's much harder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> too many All right. periods. I'm on um, bloody two hours, just about. Yeah, we've got something coming up too. This is uh, this is the first, the pilot episode of Jimmy Friend and Friends. So a little uh, side project that's going on. Sure, the end. we can be better than that. We what? can go Jimmy and Friends. Jimmy. That is, that make not Mate, Jimmy I, Friends. I just read friend. this out. This has already been written. Yeah. This exactly and that needs work. Someone come up with a creative name for I that. Like I like this guess. Jimmy Friend and Friends. Don't you, Craig? Do you like yeah, it? Yeah, I quite, I quite like it. It's yeah. a nice play friend on his right friend. last name. Yeah, yeah. I reckon you could be more creative around the friend thing, though. Jimmy well, it's your, friend seg- and it's your segment. Yeah, you're, you're paying, paying for it. <laughs> yeah, that's what. But I'm not creative. I just know how to pick on things. <laughs> well, your wife was the first guest. She was the first friend on Jimmy Friend and Friends. Uh, Bree Hook, with thanks to the running company Geelong. In the very first episode, they talk about yeah all things in the shoe and apparel and nutrition, I guess, um, industry, and a bit of background about how Bree got into things. So enjoy that, listeners. We'll do it all again next week. Anything exciting happening, Moose? Recovering. Oh, yeah, i got to go to Melbourne for a meeting tomorrow. That's kind of shitty. But, no, what is, or just, uh, no, I'm, I'm beat up. I'm going to be walking a bit. I'll be babysitting. I'll be a baby duty this week. It's Bree's turn to get out. Yep. Croaks, you coming down the beach with me? Mm, not sure. I'll let you know. We, I'm, I'm still at school this week. Ah, yeah. Still working. Got one, one more week. Yeah. All right. We'll do it all again next week, fellas. See, See you, later. guys. Bye. See ya. Welcome to Side Run Podcast new segment, Jimmy Friend and Friends. The running company Geelong is now presenting a new segment once a month that will be tacked on to the end of the episode. I am going to host the host the segment. My name is Jimmy Friend. I'm a runner. I work at the running company Geelong, and some of the patrons may have heard my voice before from Road to Berlin, which is coming to a close shortly as we are about 11 days out from race day as we speak a quick background on myself some again may have already heard this but i once was a greenskeeper i've now been running for about five years and working with julian and brie at the running company for a little over two i recently managed the geelong running store um, and just the last couple of months i've taken a bit of a new role on um, dealing with practitioners podiatrists physios and osteos creating a bit of a base of referrals for both of our stores so uh the I guess the Patreon guys will be pretty sick to death of hearing me talk about uh, the Berlin Marathon, but it's exciting (laughs) that we're four days away from flying out now. Um, And, yeah, you'll hear a bit more about that, I guess, later in the week. Um, As for the the Jimmy Friend and Friends show, I've been given the task of presenting a monthly show talking all things Nuffy Running. So I'm going to talk to runners about things within running, things that I'm seeing in the running store, things that I'm hearing running with friends, um, gear and stock that we're seeing from the brands coming in pretty much weekly. Um, so there'll be good updates um, per month on that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the things that we're selling and anything else related to the sport of running, really. Um, I'll have a new guest on each month, some of those that you'll know, some of them you'll get to know. And one familiar voice and face to begin with, is Bree Hook, who is a co-owner of the running company Geelong. Welcome, Bree. Thanks, Jimmy. It actually feels really weird talking to you on 
Skype or over the phone. I don't even know if we've ever spoken on the phone before. <laughs> it is a little funny. We spent all day together at work. And yeah. We'll do the same again tomorrow. But um, how are you this evening? Yeah, Did, I'm you good. Went to bed possibly? Yeah, yeah. She spent the day at grandma's today. So dinner, bath and bed all went seamless. So yeah. now here we are. Easy done. We'll kick things off, Bree. We'll talk uh, again, like a couple of the listeners would have heard a little bit of this from you in your um, stint on Shoe Geeks. I think we'll talk to to begin with about like your running journey. So where it began and where it's taken you. And then from there, whether it became after you started working in specialty running retail or before, how you ended up in the retail space within running as well. Yeah. So my introduction to running is Um, I'd probably say like a little bit non-traditional in a way where um, I'd never did little athletics or anything, Um, always participated in school athletics and school cross country, Um, always had a keen interest in running, grew up with my dad sort of running. So um, was surrounded by running growing up and it wasn't until I probably like later years in high school um, gave up netball as a sport and really focused on well, not really focused on running, but participated in running um, and probably thought a little bit more serious about it every time, you know, school cross country would come around a few weeks out, you know, kind of get a few runs in around the block and thought that was good training. So um, it wasn't until I actually started working at the running company in Geelong back in 2012 that that probably really ignited my passion for running. Um, I definitely had a keen interest and like for running, but I wouldn't say I was a passionate runner back then. And what was the, um, just quickly as we're currently looking at hiring staff, what was the process in 2012 when you started working <laughs> there? Did you have an in with a staff member or the owner then in Scott Nicholas or yeah. was, it a, was it a resume over the counter kind of operation? Yeah, so um, Neither of the above, really. Um, so I went in with my brother to buy shoes. I'd just been on a um, fairly big trip to Europe and just got back and left my shoes in Italy. So um, needed some shoes to run in getting home. Um, so took my brother along with me because I was kind of a little bit um, probably intimidated to go into the store by myself, actually. Um, yeah. So we went shopping together and um, Scott, uh, the owner of the store at the time, served me and we were just chatting away. And um, just through chatting, it just kind of came up that he was like, you wouldn't kind of be looking for a job, would you? And I was like, well, I'm actually unemployed. I just got back, just got got back. back from Europe. Yeah. So. <laughs> Spent all my money. Um yeah, and so he offered me a job pretty much there on the spot, and I kind of said, "Oh, look, I'm not really sure. Like, I don't, I'm not really, I don't really know what I'm going to do. Like, I mean, it sounds awesome. I might just have to think on it for, you know, a few hours if that's okay." And he's like, "Yeah, here's my mobile number. Just send me a text and let me know." And um, I was like, "Well, why not? Like, give it, give it a go. Something different." Um, I'd kind of worked in it in the health industry before that, completely different though. Um, and I thought, "Yeah, I'll give it a go." And he said, "Oh, well, if you're keen, come in and." Um, you know, in a few days' time, my manager will be working, so come on in and chat with him. Um, that was Julian. So <laughs> went in and had a chat with Jules. And um, I guess between Jules and Scott, they were like, yeah, well, um, you know, let's bring her into the store and be part of the team. And uh, so it was pretty casual, informal. I was going to say, it's not a resume. great deal, really. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll look yeah. at a resume, I guess, now, but like that informal chat, um, yeah. gauging, like, personality and personability and, and ease, ease of conversation I guess is is kind mm. of how it started as well and that was the first time you'd met Scott when he was serving you yeah totally it's the first time that's pretty cool that's pretty cool yeah. um I guess the the next kind of the next kind of step of the the running company Geelong um just to give everyone a bit of an idea who might not have um shopped at a running company store or in particular a store of yourself and Julian's before um what would you say is a brief summary of what maybe to expect when someone is to walk into the running company Geelong um, mm-hmm. specifically. So I think the biggest thing for us is that we offer such an individualised and personalised experience. So I would say that everyone's experience to an extent is the same, but it differs in how we approach the fitting process. So um, we take everyone through a fitting to help find the right shoe for them. Um, And whether it's walking, running, gym, footy, whatever it may be, if there's there's running involved, we we go through the same um, fitting process with every person. And that involves us 
you know, just having a really good chat with someone and finding a lot of a lot of information around um, that person, what they've been doing, what they're going to be using their shoes for. We get a lot of information just from simply talking with someone. So um, we have a really good chat and conversation with the customer before we even start to look at anything, before we even look at the foot um, or their running. So um, from that, we can get a really, we paint, a, I guess, a really good picture and get a really good history of that person um, and their preferences, their their injuries. Maybe they've had a little bit of a history of um, injuries that may be influenced by certain features of shoes. Um, and then we actually have a look at someone having a run on the treadmill. So um, running on the treadmill barefoot gives us a really good indication just from the rear foot exactly what is happening um, in in real time. So we use iPads, we film, we get a little bit of footage and it can just show us a little bit more around what's happening at the foot and ankle joint. And then from there, we get a little bit more of an idea on uh, what types of features may be suitable for someone. Um, we try a range of different shoes and it's really personalised to what that person likes in a shoe. Um, and it's not until someone tries a range of different shoes that they're actually able to have a little bit more knowledge around what they may or may not like. I think that's the biggest thing is someone's coming into the store for the first or even second time or even third time and particularly not really knowing what they like in a shoe. So it's not until you actually try a whole range of different options that you're kind of nutting out the specific features and feels that someone likes. And I think that's where the kind of um, you know, the way we sort of talk about it is the science versus art. And there is a science around what we do, but there is also an art form um, in terms of how we interpret people's uh, requests and perceptions of a shoe, and we try and replicate that in the product that we're that we're giving them to try. For sure, I think that um, I guess like the the features of a shoe can be like perfect for, uh, for the features of an injury or the, the um, injury someone may have. But I think like the putting the shoe on and having the shoe fit and feel good obviously mm. um, come before the function of the shoe in like that process that you've just explained. Yeah. Um, Would I you think, add anything to that? Do you like, do you see that we do anything like outside of kind of that in a nutshell? Yeah, That's kind I think of, it's yeah. very like, I kind of look at it as two categories of, of running fitting. Whereas if like someone's had or got an injury or a niggle and someone who is running injury free mm. in a certain type of shoe that they may not know what it is. And we start from like properly from scratch in that case. Yeah. Or you look at their footwear history that's been working for them and we try not to deviate too far from that. Maybe yeah, that's right. adding a shoe that could be a little bit more specific for certain types of things mm. if that was um, like a rotational shoe that they're kind of looking for. But that's like um, – that's two, I guess, like little subcategories like injured runner and running runner. <laughs> yeah, and I think um, the thing yeah. for us as well is we're not prescribing a shoe. So we're not saying, um, you know, because you've had – you know, X, Y, and Z history or injuries, like this is the only shoe for you. Like we're really sort of taking a little bit more of a, I guess, a broader range of approach and and really sort of finding that right mix of like the shoe that f feels ultimately like the best on the foot. That's um, right. That's kind of where we see the most positive outcome in terms of, um, you know, what's working well for someone is that person enjoying the overall uh, aspect of the shoe, not just a feature that someone's told them they need. So exactly. um, I think that's kind of really important to note as well. Yeah, I think the next like the, the next thing here I want to talk about is um, like some trends and some things that we've noticed in the retail running space in the past few years, whether that be like mm -hmm. footwear technology, um, like things that are selling well or not so well. But also I think what can be lumped in with that a little bit is a question about like what do you get asked a lot in store um, and why I think they can go together is because when there's something new happening, people ask about it mm. traditionally. Um, but what would you say, say like three things maybe that have happened in the running retail space in the last sort of three or four years um, that have maybe not entirely changed the game, but have been introduced and, and people are asking about it quite fre frequently? Yeah, so there's a few points. So then I guess like in no particular order, um, you know, the development of super shoes, um, all the technology that's gone into developing these amazing new foams, um, carbon plates, nylon plates, so um, plated, fun, high-stacked shoes that uh, just – like that that's in its in itself is like a world um its own world so i would say the development um of super shoes is is one area um i can remember back in 
you know, the sort of 2012, 2013 when I was working in the store and, you know, someone would be coming in wanting a racing flat. Um, and at that point you were sort of looking at like these traditional racing flats from Asics and Mizuno and Brooks even had one too, which were just such low profile, super, super rock hard, like EVA yeah. foam. You're um, running on the, like purely oh, running on top yeah. of the road. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, just so harsh on the body and, and just to see where that space has come from, um, like that's really cool. The other one would be just like, I mean, we sort of talk about on a daily basis is just the introduction of like just so much more foam under the foot. So just the increase in stack height, um, you know, the, the brands are developing these foams, which, are, you know, quite resilient um, and just giving us so much more fun and pop. Um, but we're, we're not sacrificing safety. And I guess in terms of what's safe, like what I mean by safety is um, a lot of these shoes, are the geometry of the shoe is still really safe and stable. So we're able to get this really fun running experience, but in a shoe that's not risking um, sort of any, uh, you know, overuse or, or sort of overload tissues in yeah, a way. They're, they're, um, they're adding the, I guess, currently the right amount of extra foam to combat how soft or high how high stack a foam a shoe might be yeah um, and, and that's probably where we see like that flared geometry bulky kind of mm. nature of a shoe and the way a wall looks yeah. compared to five or ten years ago is, is drastically different yeah for sure it's the one thing that most people comment on when they look down specifically from like top down like bird's eye view of a shoe just that flaring that you see from the platform of the shoe beneath and just to kind of compensate for the um you know the the platform of the shoe being softer um yeah. the midsole being softer but we're getting that flaring to enhance stability so just that inherent stability and the other feature as well and the other sort of um you know big sort of player in this space is the rocker geometry of a shoe so the introduction of forefoot rockers um even rear foot rockers to a degree as well but the rocker geometry of a shoe is massive so um i would say between the super shoe sort of development um the increase in stack and the rocker geometry that we're seeing those things combined would probably make up the majority of of the the changes that we've sort of seen and the trends that are happening at the moment but i don't even know if they're trends i kind of really feel that they're almost here to stay i can't yeah it's hard to call it a trend if it might be here for 10 15 years um, yeah that's as, right. a, as a general rule i guess like things will change in density of foam and materials they use to make plates mm. and different things like that but um the, the overall a silhouette of a shoe might not change so much for the next little while mm. um, it seems because that i guess like you say trend like 2017 or 18 we see like favor fly four percent looking at six or seven years ago now like these things are they've been around for a while it's just that it might have taken a few other brands a little while to kind of come around and um it was even funny today. We see shoes that are maybe a year away from coming out um, that traditionally haven't had a whole lot of cushion that are starting to um, come to the party as well. So I think there's, I think there's probably still more where that came from and from some brands' perspective that have been a little bit more traditional for the yeah. last few years and kind of sitting, waiting, watching, and then they'll um, they'll act upon things once they realise that it might be just the way that um, the way that everything's heading um, in the shoe world. That's for sure. I guess the the next thing is like what products are you loving at the moment? We'll start with shoes. Um, I mean, there's there's probably a, a three month period prior to now, and then three months from now where like you sort of start to see things coming to the store, what works, what doesn't, um, and, and what's sort of coming in the future that we're excited about. We'll, we'll talk about things that you've been running in, um, products you've been using or wearing, whether it's nutrition or like gloves jackets tights coming into warmer months now hats those kind of things like is there anything <laughs> that you um sort of stands out when you go to go for a run um i guess in terms of like gear or like ex like nutrition like nutrition is one um you know it's kind of marathon season at the moment so everyone's getting stuck into the gels on the long run um i've been uh, like using morton now for oh no like years um and i've really really enjoyed the product um in the most recent times i would say what how maybe three months do you reckon we've received pure nutrition? yeah probably three or four months yeah, yeah for sure it's um, yeah it's had a bit of a rapid growth like within the store mm. anyway like i know it's been around a few years and it's a it's a new zealand company so it's um like it's kind of close to home with morton being european and everything but um it, it, i guess it was a little bit slept on 
from mm. our perspective until we all um, had a crack at it. And yeah, I was that's probably the one thing that I had written down here in terms of accessories and nutrition was um, yeah. the because I'm saying Morton drink mix, caffeinated gels, gels. Um, we'll we'll see some more Morton products rolled out that maintain hydrogel technology, flavorless. Um, and, and are always working with like the most elite of the elite athletes. Um, but I think like having a product that has got a bit of flavor, has got a bit of a point of difference where it's flavored naturally um, has, has been a nice surprise that it's not that sickly artificial flavor. So yeah. just to break up the monotony of that yeah. plain Morton flavor, um, some of the pure stuff's been really good. And in particular, the cola gel um, from them, it's just got a hint of caffeine in it and it's, um, yeah, probably something that away from the shoe side of things is has been one of the bigger movers, I guess, I would say. Mm. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think, um, you know, when you are getting a product to try, um, you know, we all tried it around or I would say within – a week or two of each other in terms of like our whole team um, in the store, all the staff tried it on their long runs and it just received such positive feedback. All the flavours are, like you said, they use natural fruit flavouring. So all the flavours are really, like they're quite delicious. Um, and it's almost to a point where you look forward to taking a gel. Yeah, um, they, they taste they like what they really say nice. they're going to taste like. Yeah. <laughs> a lot yeah, of the like, stuff you get like a like a, a mango passion or something like that mm. and it doesn't really taste like a mango or a passion fruit. But yeah. they, um, they've nailed the flavours. And like, yeah, we shared a few among a couple of the guys in the long runs and like mm. we've done that before with many different um, nutrition brands. Um, and the feedback like with gels has a lot of the time been – hard to get down, need a drink after it, made me feel sick in the gut. Um, with Pure, again, it was pretty much across the board, wasn't it, where it was almost like, do you sell them? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right, yeah. Then hopefully you don't sell them kind of thing. So yeah. that was um, big on the accessory one. Would you have a favourite shoe from that similar period, last sort of three months? Oh, it's um, – oh, the last three months, whatever there. Yeah, I actually have been really enjoying um, Supercomp Trainer this time around. So yeah. um, first version and I didn't really gel well together. Um, yeah. So for me and my running gait, I just found the shoe just felt too heavy and too stiff. Um, the four-foot rocker is – is so far forward that for me it just didn't it didn't work it just didn't feel good um so this time around the shoe is much lighter um it just feels a lot more compliant underfoot it's just a really easy like a really easy shoe and i found a lot of versatility with it so um that just actually got me on too as well like a versatility um in the like Nimbus 25, that's um, a shoe that I've kind of really just found myself rotating through on a range of different days. So I'll long yeah. run in it, I'll easy run in it, I'll do a recovery run in it. I actually took, only took one shoe to Noosa um, earlier in the year when we went away and actually even did a session in it. It wasn't great um, in terms <laughs> of like the overall, shoe, it's it not my session shoe, shoe. Um, but it can be the one shoe to take everywhere if yeah. you're uh, really pushing it. Um, so I'd say from footwear, um, those sort of two stand out to me in terms of oh and I'd say in within this kind of this previous three month period alpha fly two like for me yeah. that shoe's just been an absolute banger I love every time I put it on it's just the additional pitch under the heel and the additional foam in the forefoot just under the heel pods like it, there's something that they've changed around the geometry of that shoe that just feels so much smoother to me yeah. um so that would kind of be my previous three monthly sort of um footwear rotation yeah um, i remember you come up. to work one day uh after a gym session and a jog and you're like i jog in the alpha fly this morning it's just too good not to wear <laughs> it's too good it's too good just to like steer away from without um using it unnecessarily um coming up in terms of um shoes that i have that i haven't spent much time in yet but um really keen to sort of see where they take me is um triumph 21 um so new release there um a new upper it just it does fit a lot better around the foot too so um that like that's a good one yeah i think triumph 20 i have um really enjoyed so same midsole same tooling mm -hmm. it's like you said a softer more generous um fitting upper uh can also like I've only put it on in the shop, but that TPU midsole, super durable um, and just like versatile as well. Like it probably sits pretty close to where that Nimbus is um, in amount of cushion, a little bit of return, um, feels quite 
feels quite nice underfoot and on top of the foot. Um, I was just going to have one question that I think I might roll through with all the guests and, and um, bearing in mind most of them are going to be runners of, of some degree. But um, do you have any races that you've got in the pipeline for the next sort of three to six months? Anything you like want to train for or have sort of penciled in or locked in? Yeah, I'm doing Melbourne half actually. Nice. Um, yeah, so I was um, scheduled to do Berlin, but uh, I've been nursing a hamstring niggle since November last year, and it just sort of really wasn't allowing me to to train as much as I needed to for a marathon. Um, so I thought by just cutting it back. Um, so Melbourne half, which I'm really excited for, because I've actually I've run a few halves, but. I've never really trained for a half, so I've yeah, kind of. It's always I've in the midst of a marathon but, block, or like yep, mm-hmm. as a long run with someone, or with a friend, or as a session. It's always a half can. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's hard to kind of put away a block of time to train for it because it's no, it's no small feat to train for and smash a half. It, it'll still, um, it'll still take you like your best effort to train for it and recover from it. So it um, takes up a fair bit of time for like, um, with I guess us who like the marathon, it kind of. It eats into marathon training time a little bit if you go all in on a half. So that'll be good. That'll be good to see. Yeah, um, I think like the biggest thing that person like I can almost half answer this. Um, but what do you think it is that yourself and Julian and even the staff in the store, but the way you guys prepare the staff and train the staff, I think is probably the biggest part of it. But um, what do you think it is that yourself and Julian do within the store, behind the scenes to enhance that customer experience in the store that it, it goes from, you know, 20 to 40 minutes during a fitting, it goes deep in conversation, it goes technical like science versus art, like you mentioned, um, and you get to run in the shoes. But what is the whole process? Like that's the outcome, but like the process behind that, um, is there – a whole lot of thinking is there a lot of work chat over the dinner table I can imagine um, there would be quite a bit of back and forward when ideas are popping into your head um, at home as well yeah like I think when when you're in it you're all in um, so for us we've like it's just our life really um, and so I I guess taking it back, like Jules and I want to create an environment for not only you guys, our staff, but for customers who are coming into the store, which is a really approachable, laid back, relaxed, but really personalised service and environment. So um, we really like to think of ourselves in the store as being somewhere where people can come and feel really comfortable to come in. Um, And like you said, kind of you know, divulge that information to us because we do spend a lot of time talking to someone. Um, and I think throughout that too, you you gain someone's trust. So, um, you know, we're, we're sort of trusting that someone's going to tell us everything um, and to be able to make a connection to that person for them to be able to talk to us, I think is really important. So just being a really approachable, easygoing um, sort of environment where someone comes in and, and just instantly feels relaxed and and comfortable so I think that's the biggest thing in terms of like the environment that we create um you know we we talk about um the way that we want to support running from like a grassroots level so um you know we want to be able to support people and groups and clubs through running um and we do that through sponsoring a range of different um clubs throughout Geelong but um you know just getting involved and and having the community be part um, or having runners sort of feel part of the community. Um, and the running community is is quite small um, in regards to kind of other sports. So just kind of having that camaraderie with everyone who's coming in and that, like, we're all doing this together. Um, you know, what's really cool is, like, you might, you know, spend, like you said, 30 to 45 minutes talking with someone on all things, like, no holds bar, you know, like, everyone's It's life sort of, chat a lot of the it's time. Li- it's, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's crazy, like, isn't it? It's yeah. get through the crux of the shoe, yeah. Um, the foot, the mechanics, the what we're looking at in terms of injuries or orthotics or whatever it might be. But um, in between that, like, there's a lot of chat about life, yeah. what they're training for, not training for, whether it's running or not. Yeah. Um, I think that, like, I was like I kind of said, I felt like I could almost um, like give an answer to that question, just being mm-hmm. like led by yourself and Julian for two years in the direction that obviously you guys are going and all the staff are kind of on board to come with. Um, it makes it encouraging when like both of you guys are in the store kind of doing all the things that you ask of everyone. Um, yeah. So it makes that, I guess, like owner to 
staff member relationship and like presentation on the floor almost just like everyone's doing the same job we're all in it together yeah Yeah, I think what's really cool as well is like you can be spending 30 to 45 minutes with someone and the next day you're running around the river or the waterfront in Geelong and you see that person running in the pair of shoes that you fitted them for and to me that's probably my biggest like that makes me the probably most proud and happy in a way in that like I've helped this person enjoy their running journey as much as I love running. And so that's what I hope for everyone is that like that person's walking out of the store, regardless of ability or whatever else is, is around that. But that person's putting on their shoes every day and just loving what they're doing in their shoes. And, and that for me, like my job's done. Um, So that's kind of, yeah. Couldn't agree more. Whenever we um, run from the store with a couple of boys after work, if we run past someone that's been through I just middle of whatever conversation we're having, I just say another happy customer and they get sick mm. of it pretty quickly because they're they're pretty much everywhere if you go down the river or the waterfront. Um, yeah. I want to ask a question about the future of footwear, um, probably like more short term, but you don't have to elaborate too much because some footwear uh, companies that are bringing things out don't like the the stats and the tech to be too well known before it comes out. But do you have a particular shoe model that you're looking forward to the update of, whether you know all about the update or you just want to see that shoe updated? Mm. Um, the New Balance 1080, I'm really keen to see the update of that shoe. That shoe's a shoe I've worn for like a number of iterations um, and that has actually been one of the like few models ago, it's actually been one of my favourite shoes. So yeah. um, I'm really keen and excited to get a pair of those on. Um I mean, fast shoes are always fun, so yeah. there's going to be a heap of fast shoes coming out. Um, it's a big race shoe couple of months in the first part of next year, which will yeah. be exciting. So that's, um, yeah, that's probably, like, that's that's massive. Yeah, um, I think that 1080 as well, like you say, like mm-hmm. you've probably been running in that since V9, which compared to V10, 12, and now 13 that's so coming. Different. So different. But you just mentioned like you've quite enjoyed the 1080 throughout. Yeah. I mean, it probably talks a little bit to how we spoke about the way that shoes have developed and changed and the foams have been basically, I guess, more highly engineered, we'll say, um, and it's it's giving a more enjoyable experience under the foot. Um, and that kind of kind of talks to a little bit of like how people's preferences will keep changing as the shoes do, that you've enjoyed that shoe for four years and it's been four, um, maybe three drastically different different models. Mm. Mm. Um was there any questions that you wanted to ask of me, being that we both do the TRC Geelong thing most days? Uh, well, what product, What like, I think for you, like, what are you most excited to see? I think that would be, like, kind of, well, hey, what for right now, what is your number one, like, can't go for a run without accessory? Oh, that's a really good one. Um, at the Probably the last three months, it's been gloves. Yes. Because yeah, it's been so cold, hasn't it? Yeah. And running before work at like 6 mm. and after work at like 5.30, it's just like you're never really running when it's like 10 or 12 degrees or more. It's always kind of like between 5 and 8. So yeah. gloves has been the non-negotiable on nearly every run of this build-up for Berlin. And I think like body glide. <laughs> Yeah, body glad. Like, yes, any matter. type of what anti-chase time product. Of year, yes. What type yeah. of shorts you're wearing, what yeah. top you've got on. I just yeah. I just can't live without it. So I'll be um I'll almost have one in my luggage, one in my carry on in case something goes missing on the way on the way to Good Europe. Idea. Yeah. I just can't yeah. go without. Um what's been um so again, I would say like what's been your favorite like what's currently your favorite shoe? I think the Endorphin Pro three is and it's mm-hmm. It's a race shoe for sure. I think just because I've spent, I've done a, like 250, 300 Ks in that shoe over the last few months, um, it was a little bit slept on by me, probably mm. more than anything. Um, and then when I came around and put it on, I quite enjoy the density of foam underfoot. I'm a bit of a bigger guy and it's a little bit of a firmer shoe. Like it's not drastically firmer, it's still quite responsive and, and poppy. But um, I think there's just a bit more foam and a little bit higher density. And then jogging shoe-wise, the On Cloud Monster's probably been my mm. – one of my go-tos for – I've one. had two, my second pair. So six, yes, seven, same. I'm on two, number two as well, yep. And I just found the first one, like, I almost wanted to put it on and have, like, this huge revelation about 
on cloud tech and how it's going to change everything. And I ran in it and I was like, it's there with the Triumph. It's there with the Nimbus. It's there with like your Wave Skies, Glycerins. It's mm. just a nice, smooth, simple shoe. Again, yeah. slightly on the firmer density side of things for me. So that's probably the the daily yeah, good one. I've spent a fair bit of time in. Um, just training can kind of take it anywhere. You get a gum nut stuck in your shoe from time to time, but that's about yeah. the only thing I think that I can think of um, for yep. that shoe. And then small price to pay. Yeah, exactly. Like it's yeah. it's it's super comfy and it's got a super generous fit and a really nice upper, which I think the um a lot of the on shoes have been um, mm. sort of lauded for lately is their fit and the and the quality of materials in the in the uppers and heel counters and things. They just go on a foot and kind of fit a lot of different foot shapes, which is always um, helpful for mm. us as as runners and as retailers. So I've enjoyed that. I think the um. The shoe I'm looking forward to most is the Alpha Fly 3, though. Not that I've absolutely loved the Alpha Fly 1 and 2, but um, like earlier in the year when I was in the States, I Julian got his friend Chris over there to take me through his office. Yeah. And he's a developer, footwear developer of men's running. So he had a couple of different types of samples of Alpha Fly 3 sitting around for me to have a look at and a feel of. And I felt that that shoe's probably. Um, well, people have been asking when the Alpha Fly 3 is coming for three months and it's still probably that far away again. So mm. I think it probably speaks volumes to how excited everyone is about that one. It's all over the internet. But um, until it comes to production, no one knows exactly what it's going to feel like or fit like. So I'm pretty excited to see that one come across okay. the... Hopefully it comes in a size 14. Come, yeah, or a 15. Or a 15. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully I can't wait to see that one come across the... Um, come across the ocean to Australia, which would be super exciting. Um, I do have one more question for you, Jimmy. Yep. Um, from a, I guess, like from a perspective um, in terms of the way that you see it, but what do you see as our store? Like this is a store question. Yep. Um, what do you see, like, um, how do you feel our store is, um, I guess, within the running community, what do you feel our strengths are? I think our staff are our biggest strength in each person can fit a seven-year-old for their first pair of waffles for Little Athletics, uh, a footballer at 27 years old for preseason, or someone who's just had a knee replacement at 75 and needs a shoe to walk their dog, um, equally as comfortably as the next person mm. like there's no there's no someone walks in that looks more elite or anything and someone doesn't want to serve them and someone does want to it's just if someone walks in the store they're going to get the same service from from each and every staff member yeah. and they're probably not going to know a lot different depending on who served them it's yes. going to be a really similar service they're going to end up with the the shoe that is right for their foot their ankle and their needs and I reckon that's a really like it's a really hard thing to have when you've got like we've got yourself and Julian Toby all work together for quite a period of time in Ballarat and then now in Geelong it's like we've added more staff guys have come from backgrounds of being a chef someone's like halfway between uni and traveling and like they've got different like walks of life I guess and, and being mm. able to just put them all in the same room jazz a triathlete, put them all together and just having things click and, and mm. be comfortable and happy to learn off each other and like give each other a little bit of shit here and there and like make it a fun environment to be in. Um, it, it all kind of comes together and, and it works on the shop floor where it needs to the most. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah that's, that's awesome. Probably the biggest thing. Yeah. But yeah, I reckon we're pretty much rolled through. Good. I'd yeah. Like nice question. one. I'd like to say thank you for giving us a bit of your time this evening when you could be relaxing with your feet up on the couch. So I'm glad oh, uh, on the couch. That's, I'm um, glad we could um, have, have another chat after we spoke about this for 10 minutes at work already. But, um, <laughs> yeah, thanks for thanks for giving us some of your time, Brie, and some of your running knowledge and retail industry history as it's um, it's extensive. It's been it's been probably nearly 11 or 12 years now. So there's yeah. definitely a lot of, um, like, there's a lot of nuggets of gold when someone gets served by like yourself when you can talk about the history of super shoes from the day that you first saw one or that anyone first saw one to 
five years prior to when people were racing in um in some uh, pretty questionable flats we'll call them yeah but um yeah on behalf of the inside running podcast thanks for your time thanks jimmy it was fun yeah thanks for having me it was cool easy cheers see ya see ya see you tomorrow (laughs) see ya This episode was brought to you by the running company Geelong. If you'd like to look after a small business rather than the mega companies of the world, then hit up myself, Moose, and our awesome team down in Geelong or on Instagram at therunningcompany__geelong.